your live doctor okay good evening everybody uh, jaipur of thermological society welcomes all the delegates speakers and the esteemed panelists to bullseye the webinar on macular disorders we would like to specially thank professor hasan mortada from egypt for taking out time from his busy schedule and enlightening us with his vast knowledge on the subject as we all know due to the present covid times these online academic interactions are the best way to keep us all connected with each other and also with the academics i would now like to request our president dr virendra agarwal who does not need any introduction to kick start today's show without delay thank you vishal i welcome everybody for today's scientific extravaganza by galaxy of national and international stars in retina the eminent panelists for today are professor dr lalit verma right now he is vice president of all india film society also and very dynamic work he has done for all india film society as various post dr shobhit chawla he is the president of vrsi and senior vr surgeon and director of prakash netra kendra lucknow our own dr rajkumar sharma he is right now president of rajasthan film society and a senior vr consultant in jaipur dr raja narayanan who is the honorary secretary of vrsi i think it is his second term and he is director of clinical research and senior vitro retinal consultant at elu prasad eye institute dr ajay pal singh he is from again from jaipur he is a senior vitro retinal consultant and he is a director in max vision eye center jaipur i request dr dilip roma sir to start the session and i request panelists will call the speakers and give a brief introduction of the speakers just before their talk i myself will take pleasure of introducing dr hasan motarda before his keynote address we will have questions from the panelists one or two questions after each talk and after the last talk we will have some audience questions for the panelists thank you very much so over to dr dalit verma sir thank you dr virender i am very happy to be participating in this uh, uh, predominantly surgical kind of webinar and uh, we have uh, with us uh, galaxy of speakers and uh, usually macula is one area which uh, is a very sensitive area i think if you consider ophthalmology as a whole the most sensitive area in the eye from where all of us see and surgery here becomes very relevant when to do what to do and how much to do because it's very very important because the dictum should always be to try to improve these patients already existing vision you see always keep this in mind when so you are appro approaching or operating on a macular pathology so our aim should be whatever patient vision has or complaint he has aim should be to improve aim should not be show to show any kind of surgical heroism that uh, we remove this membrane we create one iatrogenic issue and ultimately patient's vision is poorer than what he came to so that i am very very sensitive to this uh, issue that surgical intervention should only be done when so ever we can improve patient's vision or quality of life or his complaint i think with this uh, remark uh, and we have a huge number of national stalwarts as well as our guest from egypt hosan uh, motada we have seen so many surgeries of dr motada that we always uh, learn so much from his surgeries so we'll begin with uh, our uh, our own uh, president vrsi that is dr shobit chawla he will uh, give us some tips about uh, myopic uh, polyoschisis no i think the first talk is on that first talk you okay first talk Okay, first talk is uh, named as patient as partners. I think uh, this is a sponsored talk uh, uh, which Shobhit has very kindly agreed to give. How can uh, patient become partner in our uh, retina care? So over to you, Shobhit. We talk. Everybody will keep the mic in mute. Thank you very much, Jaipur of Thermic Society, Dr. Vilain Ragarwal, Dr. R. K. Sharma, and Dr. Vishal. Uh, we are passing through unusual times, and uh, 
both for the patient and for the consultant. So this is basically a talk in that spirit. So patient partnership uh, is based on the knowledge a patient develops from the experience of uh, health and psychosocial problems from the trajectory of care and services and the impact of these problems on his personal life and that of his relatives. It's a complex situation where we have to help the patients nowadays by focusing on a lot of aspects which patients and all of us are passing through these unusual times. Our diabetic loads are going up as we know. Long term complications of the chronic disease affect every system in the body, eyes, kidneys, heart, feet, nerves. And the highest increase after China is seen in India over the years. And we are expecting the numbers to keep on going up. Majority of the patients with diabetes have at least one comorbid disease and up to 40% have at least three, increasing the number of appointments required by various specialists, whether it be an endocrinologist, whether it be a nephrologist or cardiologist or the retinologist. Prevalence of diabetes related comorbidities during follow of DME cases is given here and renal disease figures quite high in the number as does cerebrovascular disease and other disorders. We all know it is in our country where most of the patients are not covered by insurance but take on the burden of treatment themselves. It is indeed a complex issue and insurance many times does not even co cover pre-existing diabetes. So a lot of expenses are out of the pocket. This is a chart of the average visit by a DME patient in six months. And uh, after the nephrologist, retina, retina specialist figure high among the list. Patient adherence is itself affected by factors including age, psycho, psychological status, expectations of treatment, which despite lot of counseling many times are not met. Ease of travel and cost, especially in these times in our country where the economy is also hit and travel is not simple. You require permits to enter from state to state. You require permit even at times to enter into a district. Work related obligations and comorbidities reduce the compliance. And in uh, in a lot in lot of places, the most common reason is dissatisfaction at one center and the patients goes, you know, shopping at the other center. Uh, then going to another doctor and many times morbidity like death. If we look at injection frequencies in DME, they show a more pronounced decrease from a median of six injections in the first year to between one and two in year two and four before rising more in the sixth year. The mean number of injections in, with anti-VGFs in real world studies figure on an average about five. While if we use dexamethasone implants, the number falls down dr drastically. Uh, giving us almost the same visual gain and the final visual ac equities. So frequent injections are also an added burden, burden to ophthalmologists. A reduced number of intravitreal injections could reduce the bur burden of care for patients and optimize patient outcomes. Even in real world studies, uh, inject, uh, these are the let mean letter gains which have been so seen with the dexamethasone implant and average is around six letter gains per injection uh, which then stabilizes treatment of dme and rvo with intravitreal injection therapy 
and the requirement for multiple and repeated hospital visits has a large practical impact on patients quality of life each injection appointment took and this is a study by seva prasad and his colleagues published in 2016 took an average of 4.5 hours comprising an average of 79 minutes of travel time in our country this could be lo- longer and 188 minutes of appointment time for the patient who who work for the patients who work needed a day off at least so multiple visitations in the current pandemic uh, is risky especially for diabetics besides being exposed to the risk of pandemic exposure there are other disadvantages there is a lot of anxiety involved as we are all experiencing in our practice the patients are anxious they want to come quickly get over and go back and you're anxious you also don't want them sticking in the hospital for long in the outpatient department uh so more patients with dme reported being anxious having their sleep affected and having reduced concentration when compared with patients of rvo this is another study and uh, in the current pandemic additional reports of anxiety from patients related to needing to ask for carrier which led to patients feeling guilty multiple visitations also uh, in have more cost implications an average cost of anti vgfs is higher than the average cost uh, of uh, an implant which can last with its effect for about 3 and a half months on an average this some of the patients uh, i'll be coming to the figure later just giving you a case example of a patient whom we changed from anti vgfs after march and uh, we this patient had a was an only eye patient and it had a effect close to phase 2 60 vision another patient who had a cataract with dme in the right eye pseudophakia with dme cataract surgery was done in the left eye in 2019 there was aggravation of dme and uh, the patient had already received about 11 injections in each eye over the last 2 years in 2018 and 2019 so in 2020 we switched him on to ozurdex he was also keen for less injections and we've had a fair stabilization of vision which was the same le- level he would after achieve after anti vgf therapy in current times relevant to realize that added cost of covid rt pcr test before if you are following the protocol and the logistics involved in it fewer injections less number of covid test costs our switch has been nearly 70% to steroid therapy because of this reason from anti vgf therapy post march 2020 it has been surely our choice when there is added burden of cataract surgery to patients in presence of dme we have been routinely using in patients who are post 60 years and fake it with some lenticular changes also amidst this pandemic considerations towards patient and treating doctors social distancing therapeutic distancing and quality of life is important for chronic pathologies such as dme we have this alternative so this is just a thought wave on the present uh, scenario uh, any discussion on the same is welcome thank you shobhit uh, for your frank views on uh, management of uh, diabetic macular edema uh let us have uh, you know one or two questions from the panel because i myself uh, am a very uh, you know frequent sh- i shift to ozurex especially in dma pretty fast i do not wait uh, mandatory 3 or sometimes 6 injections as uh, bresler uh, you know uh, tells in his talks uh because uh, we, specifically uh, in dme 
like ARMD patients are old patients, you see 60, 70, but DME is, most of them are working population also. So you don't want them to keep coming very frequently to your clinic. So I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, all the joints to be here, uh, do they consider as a primary treatment and when do they shift? Only two, two questions are very important. So we'll ask Anand, Anand, when do you, do you, do you ever do primary treatment? Treatment now, first time Ozodrex? I actually don't do primary treatment unless there is a systemic uh, uh, total, you know, uh, contraindication. For example, somebody has a stroke or a MI or something like that. For systemic reasons, uh, th that is when I would uh, go for uh, steroids as a primary treatment. And how, uh, how, I, how, early, how early do you shift? If I would if probably shift within, if in two injections, I see absolutely no response. Uh, it's uh, absolutely the same. Then I would feel encouraged. Also, especially if the patient is pseudophagic and is an elderly patient. And that happens quite often. Elderly, pseudophagic patient. Why elderly? Because the incidence of IOP rise is a little lesser. And with Ozodex, we know it's even lesser than tricot. And pseudophagia, because obviously there's no risk of cataract. So in these cases, elderly pseudophagia patient, I would do. Also, also if I know the pathology or the history before, if I, you said treatment name, I know. But if this patient has had, say, three or four injections and I've had the benefit of knowing what those results were and I found and I found that it didn't benefit, then perhaps I might be a little more encouraged to start off with steroids in this yeah. at this point a little earlier. Okay. Okay. For you, so yeah, usually I don't start I mean, uh, with Ozudex. First line of treatment for me for DME is basically anti-VGF. But as uh, Anand said, in pseudophagics with the very high CMT, very uh, means more than 600 uh, micron or those uh, with the comorbidities, yes, I do start with Ozudex in these cases. Vishal? Sir, my concern is that if the patient is not able to come again and again, yeah. it actually is more economically viable and more effective to use Ozodex as a prime therapy. Of course, I go just not of the edema part. I do a FFA. And if there's a lot of ischemia or small areas of neovascularization. I might inject anti-VEGF uh, yeah. with the treatment. But if there is not much CNP areas and the edema is not, I would go with Ozodex as the prime therapy. So you take even in patients uh, who are fake. -ic. So yeah, yeah, that I agree. So you take into consideration FA picture like CNP and ischemia. The baseline will always have a FFA, every diabetic. Yeah. Raja. Raja is there. I think uh, Lalit, it might be a little relevant to focus on this question in light of the current pandemic. Yeah, yeah, I will. I am coming to that because your uh, two slides were quite interesting. That uh, you see, somehow I do not uh, do, uh, you know, routine uh, uh, COVID test in any of the injections. We do it only for uh, GA patients or, you know, plastic patients or long surgeries. But I think uh, there is a rationale of what you have been saying that in COVID era, we obviously want to decrease the number of visits because all patients who enter my hospital are treated as potential COVID positive and we take uh, you know, precautions, irrespective. So that is the best way to deal with COVID, that you treat everybody as positive. Like our waiting area has capacity for 80 patients, but only 10 patients are sitting there. And all those triage and everybody does that. Hafsan Matada, uh, would you like to, like to throw some light on this uh, about uh, DME management, uh, your choice of treatment, anti vegf versus steroids? Um, usually, I do not like to start with um, with the steroids. Uh, I start with the anti VEGF, uh, mainly ILEA. This is my first choice, and my second choice is uh, Lucentis. Um, I use uh, steroids um, in persistent macular edema, especially when the patient underwent previous vitrectomy. Uh, I like to inject. Ozordex because it may act for longer time, but I usually measure the intraocular pressure before injecting Ozordex. If it is in the range of 18, 19, 20, I usually refrain from injecting Ozordex because this patient may develop 
glaucoma that may be difficult to control. Um, but if it is in the 14, 12, 14, uh, so I may inject Ozodex. In my uh, practice, Ozodex does not last for more than two, two and a half, maximum three months, yeah, not yeah. more than that. And yeah. if you inject the regular triamcin alone, it usually lasts for two months. So for the sake of cost, I may start by using triamcin alone first as a test. And if there is response uh, to triamcin alone, then I may inject the patient with other decks after that. So I don't usually start with other decks because you may inject other decks and the patient uh, shows no response. So um, we start with a little bit cheaper drug, which has the same, almost the same effect. And if it is effective, I go on with the other decks. But I usually keep other decks for patients with persistent edema um, after uh, the tracking, so in a fluid-filled filled eye. Uh, but you usually start with the, the anti-VHF, um, not with steroid. Uh, Shobit, you are a very, uh, you know, fond user of uh, Ozodex. Your uh, take on, uh, you know, using it, this as a primary treatment, specifically in patients who have vitrectomized eye. So what I could gather here was that Patients who have contraindications to anti vhf like very recent stroke, pseudophagic, and vitrectomized eye. At least three of these indications can yeah. become can become primary kind of indication for those uh, drugs. One more indication, if I can add, is pregnancy. Uh, overall, at the uh, panel, everyone agrees that anti vhf would be the first choice, but only for some safety reasons. Sometimes we use other drugs. Yeah. In fact, Raja has just done a very interesting study where he has been using it in conjunction with anti-VGF in AMD cases. Yeah, I remember there was a long time back, uh, you know, Augustine and all, they used to, you know, in AMD, they used to have triple therapy for, uh, uh, for uh, AMD. You remember, Anand, you used to, you know, discuss and debate about that. Yes, yes, yes. That was a very interesting debate in uh, <laughs> the other side. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, Ajay, anything you would like to add or Sangeet to this treatment to what you Ajay, muted, I think I'm muted, muted Ajay. Ajay, can you unmute? Yeah. yeah. The only thing I do is I begin with anti vgf always and I start uh, topical steroids just to check the steroid responder status. In okay. case that is a very painful, that's a very painful kind of uh, to how to find that is a steroid responder. Because that takes the drops for a couple of weeks and only. No, it drop. takes. No, it doesn't take more than two weeks, sir. And after injecting anti vgf only, I will require Ozudex only after maybe when and after two months, not before that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's my practice, and uh, practically only in vitrectomized eyes, I have injected Ozudex. By chance, uh, I don't Look, require. Sure. Uh, anything anything to be added? Nothing. Nothing. So. So one thing is like uh, some biomarkers uh, which are. Yeah, yeah. I was coming to that. If you have yeah. too much of uh, HRF or, you know. Uh, HRF or there is neurosensory detachment. Yeah. Too uh, less ischemia. So, so does, does, that, does that lower your threshold for Osudex or uh, you are tempted to use that first line? Uh, I will I will definitely go as a first choice in these type of cases. If especially if it's a, especially if, if he is a pseudo yeah yeah yeah. So inflammatory kind of biomarkers which uh, you know uh, like uh, uh, CSD uh, or hyperreflective dots and yeah HRF yeah yeah. yeah. So I think uh, very nice. I think uh, uh, what we have discussed is at least three four indications. I think all of you agree that vitrectomized eye, where there is a contraindication, pseudophagic, and biomarkers, which uh, and pregnancy, which Raja said, these four five, these these five uh, indications may, especially pseudophagic, we may consider as first line primarily now because Ozurex 
economy wise also and especially in covid era as shobhit has very nicely pointed out that we do not want this patient to keep coming uh, specifically till the time till that we don't know till how much time corona lasts so we should uh, you know try to give treatment so that number of visits or his interaction to this in the clinic is reduced and covid so, test is also only valid for 7 days yeah true <laughs> we get it done normally 72 hours before the procedure for every patient correct that is true that is true sir just a minute i am not yes. a veterinary surgeon and you all are veterinary surgeon you are discussing it well but what i want to say that our non veterinary people are also attending this webinar so what message you so want to give for them they they want to refer so, uh, they want to refer it to retina patients uh, to retina specialist yeah. but sometime what happens the patient is asking sir i want your opinion between the two so just give us the guidelines where we can say that this is the reason that ozodex is better because sometimes it is so a positive just, treatment then anti vegf thank you render for asking no it's firstly let me remove this myth it is not costly okay yeah. it is not costly to anti vegf if you consider what dr motada also said 3 months at last okay 3 months it lasts and all of us agree that first line of management in a treatment like patient especially in a fake patient we start with an anti vegf and after two injections if the response is inadequate as judged by uh, the line improvement as well as by ocp then we shift to ozodrex however in certain eyes which all of us agreed that pretectomized dye or inflammatory biomarkers pregnancy or pseudo fake or contraindications in these four five situations and in covid era and covid era in these five situations it may become the first line of management also so that is the message for general ophthalmologist which uh, viru i am thankful to you uh, that you have asked this question. dr lalit one comment if Thank i can you, make i have shown in my earlier presentations others other webinars also ozodex is not the same like anti vegf injection avastin that anybody will be able to give it's uh, difficult it's a different needle it's a uh, vitreous can yeah. come out uh, and it can cause damage to the lens if it has not been given earlier or trained so that caution also has to be taken thank you raja thank you raja viru viru also remember that you see all ld vegf are 30 gauge this is 22 yeah. gauge 23 gauge therefore therefore we do encourage a general ophthalmologist to become partners in uh, diabetic care and hair and the care However, to go to Rex, I would personally request that let uh, VR surgeon be the primary uh, treating physician for for lens or ozodex because it's not a straightforward injection. And people who think that straightforward, uh, unless you have had training in medical treatment, so that's what one thing. One thing. One, one uh, issue which I like to discuss with cataract surgeons that they, if they are operating an eye which has cataract and DME, yeah. Uh, Have implanted the lens, and if they have been adequately trained in putting ozodex, that is a good indication for them to combine both. Uh, so, this is something uh, we did long time back. We had some symposiums for cataract surgeons where we, uh, you know, taught them how to go ahead with ozodex in the in this situation, which is a great indication. and uh, the cataract surgeon also becomes a partner in care so before before we move to sangeet mittal i will ask anand this suppose there is a treatment nigh patient of dme and he has a significant cataract also and uh, he is he is significant significant cataract means that uh, cataract surgery is indicated plus he has a dme so will you consider at this time anti vegf or steroid so uh, i actually prefer to go with uh, anti vegf uh, first i actually don't do combined uh, uh, cataract with uh, injections so i know there are studies to show that it's effective but i would rather do it probably even just a week ahead or maybe even 10 days ahead and keep the vegf levels down and then do the cataract so that's my practice the okay. only the reason i talk about that is because in the very 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 rare instance of you know infection happening that it, you don't really want to have steroids in the eye so it's just yeah, that anybody anybody would differ in from this or all of us agree with this i wouldn't differ but i would say that i would like to give the f- first anti vgf injection and yeah so the patient when I, the second injection can be a steroid if the patient wants to avoid too many visits 
along with the cataract surgery after a month or a month and a, or 40 days. That is what the window I look at. It's another way of, you know, looking in the real world management of these patients. So sorry to interrupt. Okay. I think we should okay, proceed think... towards the yeah. surgical talks now. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I think uh, this was the last uh, question. And now we move on to a very, very important uh, scenario, which is optic nerve pit. And uh, we have Sangeet Mittal who does very nice uh, video on uh, on uh, VR procedures. I request Sangeet to tell us uh, about optic nerve pit, his approach, um, surgical approach. Over to you, Sangeet. Thank you, sir. I'll share my screen now. Sir, is my screen visible? Yeah. Yes, yes. Please carry on. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Jaipur Ophthalmological Society, Dr. Vishal Agarwal, Dr. Indra Agarwal, and Dr. Arke Sharma for giving me this opportunity. So I'll just start a brief introduction about optic pit which is a small excavation of optic nerve head and it's a very rare uh, anomaly, not very common. Where in one in 10,000 eyes is present. And it's due to incomplete closure of superior end of the embryonic fissure. Most of the pits are located temporal uh, uh, on the temporal edge of the optic disc, but some may be central, but uh, closer the pit is to the margin of the optic nerve head, more are the chances of the associated maculopathy. And uh, association of optic nerve pit with a central serous detachment is also called Cranenberg syndrome. And it is present in 40 to 50% of patients who have optic disc pit. And it could be inner layer or outer layer or both with the retinal stesis. So this is basically what the pathophysiology of uh, uh, various uh, theories have been given, but the most accepted now nowadays the theory by Havel Linkoff, when he said that it is due to uh, the vitreous fluid which enters and causes enters the pit and causes an inner uh, inner layer stesis and inner layer stesis the fluid seeps into the outer layers causing a outer retinal detachment. So this is the theory which forms the basis of treatment uh, uh, of the optic disc pit with maculopathy nowadays. The principle lies uh, just as the pathogenesis says that there is an abnormal communication between the vitreous and the cerebrospinal fluid. And there's dynamic fluctuation in the gradient between the intraocular pressure and intracranial tension, which directs the movement of fluid. Uh, any kind of vitreous traction over the pit is also responsible for opening of this communication. And the treatment requires elimination of this translaminal pressure gradient or closure of the pathway for fluid flow into the retina. So uh, uh, various options that are available are, first one is the green laser or the argon laser treatment when one or several rows of laser were given between the serous detachment and the optic disc uh, and only to the elevated retina in the peripapillary area. But uh, many studies have shown that there is no difference in treated and untreated eyes in which argon laser is used solely as the only treatment for the treatment of optic pit. So vitrectomy has been tried for this optic pit. Uh, first of all, we used to do vitrectomy with gas. Uh, <laughs> Same vitrectomy with gas and, and laser combined again at the edge of the optic disc. Nowadays, uh, we generally do vitrectomy, gas, and, and we do internal limiting membrane peeling. Especially nowadays, we put a flap uh, into the pit to close the communication that is existing uh, between the vitreous fluid and the CSF. So, this is a small demonstrative case how we do it. So, this is a 16 years female. She had an op optic nerve head pit with maculopathy. You can see a massive uh, detachment of the retina below the fovea, uh, uh, below the fovea involving the fovea now. And she had gone uh, undergone a juxtapapillary laser, which was done elsewhere. And her best corrected vision at this stage was 36. So this is how we would do the surgery. First of all, we stain uh, the we induce the PVD using intravitreous trimsinolone. We have to be very slow. These are very young patients. And if the vitreous is tightly adherent to the retina, so we have to be very slow when we are inducing the PVD. Then we uh, do an internal limiting membrane peeling. In this case, I have, I have removed the whole of the uh, ILM uh, from arcade to arcade, sparing the juxtap juxtapapillary area from where the flaps are put inside the pit. And in this, uh, uh, in in optic disc pit, unlike in macular holes where we which we have to stuff it uh, quite hard. We, this, these flaps, they just get sucked into the pit. 
and then we do apply uh, the laser around the optic disc in the elevated retina. In the end, we uh, use gas as a tamponade. We can use both short acting. Generally, we use a short acting gas in these cases, like SF6. So this is three months post-operative, the same patient, although there is a small neurosensory detachment still persisting, but the uh, fluid is almost uh, uh, gone and the vision has improved to six by 12. The pit is uh, closed. So sometimes there will be a gliatic tissue as in this patient, if you see the optic now had, there was a thin fi fibrous tissue overlying the optic disc uh, pit and this gliatic tissue needs to be removed. Otherwise it will keep on causing traction at the optic disc pit. So this was a patient, he had vision of six by 60 and you see I'm removing here the gliotic tissue which is present over the pit. It is again quite, uh, quite adherent. And then proceed with the similar proceed in the similar fashion. You do a ILM uh, peel, and the juxtapapillary flaps then are introduced into the pit. Again, uh, do a fluid gas uh, fluid air exchange. Do some laser around the optic disc pit in the area of the elevated retina. This case I did just 15 days ago. And today only he showed me, came for follow-up. This is two weeks post-operative. The uh, fluid, the, inter, the outer retinal detachment has decreased, the sclesis has decreased, and the patient's vision has improved to six by 18 uh, after two weeks. But there is one uh, problem which can occur in, in very chronic uh, patients. And this was a 36 years old female. She had a decrease of vision for one year and she was treated elsewhere as central serous retinopathy for one year and her best corrective vision had uh, gone down to counting figures at two meters only. In this patient, uh, this is a quite an, uh, three, four years ago, I had did, done this surgery. And again, in this patient, I, we started with the, the optic, uh, the ILM peel. In this patient, I did a complete ILM peel. But in this patient, we because of the chronicity, uh, uh, ideally I should have done a phobia sparing ILM peel. But unfortunately, in this patient, I did a complete ILMP, and this patient landed up with a post-operative uh, macular hole. Though the fluid has decreased and uh, decreased, and the species has decreased, but there was a macular hole, and the vision, uh, although it improved to six by sixty, I offered the patient the second surgery, but the patient refused. She was happy with six by even with the six sixty vision, and was not willing to undergo the second surgery. But this now we should keep this in mind that a chronic uh, patients we we uh, this problem can occur. So nowadays we generally do a in these type of patients we do a fovea sparing ILM peeling. This was again a 26 years old female who uh, with six months pregnancy and she was being treated elsewhere as pregnancy induced CSR, and she had a best corrected vision of six by 36. So on examination there was an uh, optic disc pit at the temporal. And there was a large uh, uh, detachment involving the macula. After this, uh, uh, in this uh, again, we did, did this ILM peel, but uh, we spared the fovea. You see, I'm raising the flaps from the outside towards the center, and I'm not touching the foveal area at all. And uh, once I have done this, I'll just uh, trim of these flaps, sparing the fovea. So with the cutter, I just trimmed off these flaps. The fovea was spared in, uh, again, we, we had the juxtapapillary island flaps also. We stuffed them into the pit and then uh, uh, proceeded further with the fluid air exchange and, uh, and laser. This is this case I did uh, just before this uh, corona lockdown started and uh, 15 days post-operatively patient had, uh, I had seen that patient uh, the, the fluid has decreased uh, and, uh, and uh, I, I, I'm in touch with her on uh, phone and she said that she is feeling better uh, now with time. So these are some more uh, patients. We did the same way and uh, you see uh, these patients, they all uh, showed good improvement after this surgery. And uh, Again, this patient with, who had undergone laser earlier showed a uh, improvement. 
Now coming to optic disc colobomas, which are again large discs with inferior uh, excavation, again a uh, rare condition, and it's usually sporadic and unilateral, and most of the cases present with decreased visual equity. And sometimes this optic disc coloboma can also be uh, associated with a pit inside the coloboma causing uh, maculopathy. Like in this patient, there was a, a maculopathy with outer retinal uh, detachment. And uh, this patient was advised surgery at this stage, but uh, she refused surgery at this time and later on came with an uh, increase in the fluid and leading to almost uh, subtotal retinal So now she was ready for surgery. We operated this patient again uh, using triamcinolone. Uh, we induced the PVD and we have to be very slow. Uh, the vitreous is very adherent at the coloboma edges and uh, otherwise also. And if we are not careful, we may tear the retina. So you can see this is a communication between the uh, vitreous and the subretinal space. Uh, the fluid was coming out. So in this patient also, we raised those juxtapapillary flaps and we stuffed these flaps into this uh, pit and coloboma. And then uh, did laser around the coloboma and uh, around the optic disc coloboma and the associated choroidal coloboma also. Then we did a fluid fluid air exchange, and then in the end we used uh, C three F eight gas for the tamponade. And this is six, six months post operative. The patient's vision had improved to six by eighteen. So this is another patient. Uh, this was done by by my associate, Dr. Kamaljeet, and she did this case. Uh, so after removing the gliotic tissue and inducing the PVD, vitrectomy was uh, completed. Again, some more glasses was seen, and then uh, it was removed. A fluid air exchange was done. She did a retinotomy here. And, uh, uh, and in the end, oil was injected. So the only difference in this case was that we did not do a peripapillary laser in this time. And uh, this again is a, sometimes is a very commonly reported problem. You can see here, there are some fish egg like things. These are some subretinal silicon uh, oil bubbles, which have gone, uh, the uh, silicon oil has gone subretinal uh, through the coloboma in this, uh, these eyes. And this is again a very commonly reported uh, misadventure which happens with these surgeries. So now, last coming to the, the uh, morning glory syndrome. Uh, again, you have a large disc with funnel shaped excavation and spoke like vessels emerging from the disc. And there is an annulus, annulus of choriretinal atrophy uh, around this uh, uh, disc and multiple narrow and straightened retinal vessels. And again, there is a central tuft of white fiber overlying the disc. Though this is not a related case, but Vishal asked me to include this into uh, the discussion. I'll just go briefly through this. So this was a 26 year old male who presented with a uh, optic uh, disc, a morning glory uh, optic disc, uh, which showed contractions of the disc. So you can see the disc in all the three phases. You see uh, there is a contracted phase of the disc when the disc is smaller and after some time it just uh, pulsates, it becomes larger and again uh, very large and you see the vessels are moving apart. This is the fluorescein angiogram of the same patient and you see the vessels which are closer during the early phases have moved up, apart in the late phases. So this was uh, uh, and we have to take care, we, when, whenever we see a morning glory syndrome, it, the, actually the diagnosis is so striking, the appearance is so striking that you suddenly make a diagnosis and then forget all about it. But just if you look carefully, so this can, these anomalies can be having some variants like this, uh, uh, this morning glory disc with uh, contractile uh, phenomena. And I've seen three, four, three cases in overall uh, of this kind of uh, thing. And another variant of morning glory, again, it could be associated with maculopathy as we were discussing. And this patient, you see there is an outer retinal detachment again uh, in this area. And uh, uh, this, she was again, this is a 12 year old girl. She was again advised surgery, but uh, they did not undergo surgery, came back later with a full fledged retinal detachment. And then at that time we did the surgery again, uh, in this case also, we have to take care that we have to remove this glial tissue completely. And the, uh, when we, we, for inducing the PVD also, uh, we have to be very careful. We have to 
uh, use the forceps in this case, uh, remove the glial tissue and induce the PVD along with it. And then this glial tissue is very important. You have to remove completely. And once this is removed, then we created a retinotomy, a drainage retinotomy. The retina was flattened. The fluid air exchange was done. The laser was done around the uh, disc and 360 degrees in this uh, patient. And uh, silicon oil was injected in the end. And this is six months post-operative after silicon oil removal. The patient's vision had improved and the retina was attached. So in, to conclude, optic disc ex excavations with retinal detachment can be managed with good anatomical and functional results. And early treatment is always better for the best results. Thank you. Thank you, sir. A lot of pits you have in your collection. So many. Uh, can I ask Sangeet a question? Yeah, uh, I think uh, Sangeet, excellent video. So you're not audible, sir? Yes, Sangeet, uh, audible or not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What I was asking was that uh, do you have any visual grade area of obtaining a pit? Like below this, you will operate, and above this, you will not. Or any pit with maculopathy, Cranenberg syndrome, you will operate. Hello? Sangeet? Yes, no, no, not yet. Yeah. No, is there any visual grade area for you to operate? Actually, I'm not hearing your voice. Vishal, are you hearing me? But sir, are you hearing me? Hello. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Sangeet. Sangeet, the question is: Do you have any vision criteria for these patients for surgery? Uh, uh, so once the uh, once the pit uh, once there is a maculopathy, I will operate with. Hello. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, yeah. Again. Yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, sir, I, I, uh, sir, sir, I don't. I, I just go with the once. Uh -huh, okay, cool. Yes, Sangeet. Sir, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Yes. So we can come to uh, Dr. Sangeet's presentation questions after the okay. next presentation. Okay. Can I add one point to it, uh, Vishal? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Yes. yes. Okay. So, answering the question, I look for recent visual loss. Recent means visual loss over one year. If the patient is giving me a history of visual loss over one year, uh, then I am able to prognosticate the case better. Secondly, is a point that. In my first six cases, I had done non-foveal sparing peel and uh, I had macular holes in two patients. So what now I've started doing is using Professor Morta's envelope peel. So one flap goes onto the pit and four small flaps come onto the thinned out fovea so as to fortify it. And uh, I have seen that really helps. After that, I have done about six more cases, no, seven more cases, and I have not had in any patient a formation of a macular hole. So it's like a fortification, and the visual result has been fair, but one has to give these patients at least four to six months for vision to gain the maximum. I have never used laser across the maculopapular one. Absolutely. I think uh, you see the peel across the fovea uh, is, is risky. In fact, it has to be it has to be multi-layered flap and one flap only goes into the octagonal pit. And uh, and uh, I agree. So can, I, can I add one point? Yes, we shall. So besides everything I agree on, but uh, lasering around the pit, I have uh, you know, long left. Um, 
I do. I think yeah. it will be a little yeah. more destructive, and uh, you know, lasering at the papillomacular bundle can mm-hmm. you know have visual effects after the surgery. Correct. Vishal, Vishal Motida wants to make a comment. Yes. Sure, sure, sure. I yeah, Doctor Motida, your words. Yes. Um, excellent presentation, Sangit. Uh, but um, I, I really uh, afraid of creating a macular hole in these cases, yes. although the instance. Uh, is low, but um, why not to peel the ILM over the fovea if there is any risk of inducing a macular hole? So what I'm doing now is fovea sparing ILM peeling, or I start peeling nasal to the fovea and use the ILM to stuff it into the uh, into the pit. So I do not cross over the fovea, and in this way. Um, you may reduce the risk of creating an immaculate hole. This is the first comment. Um, for the morning glory syndrome, these are really difficult cases. And um, in large morning glory syndrome, large defect, um, one has to be very cautious because you may create um, breaks inside the globoma while dissecting the glial tissue inside the globoma. So if this happens of creating a hole inside the globoma, you are really in a diff- very difficult situation. And the only way to close the hole inside the globoma is to use a graft. And I prefer the use of the amniotic membrane graft to cover a break inside the Globoma in morning glory syndrome. Um, I don't like to use silicone oil in the morning glory syndrome because there is risk of the silicone oil migrating into the, the brain. And there are cases reported in the literature of silicone oil migrating into the brain. So in large uh, defects of the optic nerve in morning glory syndrome, um, I usually use gas and um, I don't prefer to use silicone oil. Um, these are my comments. So um, you have to take measures to guard against creating macular hole by fovea sparing, um, ILM peeling, or peeling nasal. And then you have to put the ILM inside the um, pit, inside the globoma, inside the, uh, the pit. And for this reason, for this, I used, usually use the 41 gauge cannula to push the ILM inside the, um, the, uh, the defect or the pit. And I, in this way, you are sure that uh, it is inside the, the pit. So uh, these are my comments. Thank you. I think that was a wonderful uh, uh, this thing. But do you laser or not? Because laser was one controversial thing, a lot of people, because most of us don't. Yeah. No, I don't do laser because um, if you close the uh, way transmitting the fluid by closing the pit, then you don't have to do laser. Yeah. If you, so you have to close the pit and, um, and you have to close it with the use of um, the ILM. And if it is large, you may use the amniotic membrane uh, flap. Yeah. So we all agree that it has to be a uh, foveal sparing ILM. We all agree that it, something has to be used to close the pit, whether it is a nasal this ILM flap or, or amniotic, or some people have used lateral graft also, and a lot of tissues with it, and, and, uh, and, uh, and use gas only. There's no need of any laser to the papillomacular bundle, as we shall just say. I think with this, we move on. We move on to Dr. Raja. To tell us about uh, what 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 uh, tricks he uses for ILM flaps and graphs in macular hole. Over to you, Raja. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lalit Verma, uh, and also many thanks to Jaipur of Thalmic Society for inviting me. I'll just uh, my video is very short, uh, but I'll just re-emphasize what Dr. Asan Morta pointed out about silicon oil. Uh, we had a case where silicon oil migrated to the optic chiasm. Patient had to undergo emergency neurosurgery 
to decompress the optic chiasm because it was not just affecting the affected this disc pit eye it was affecting the other eye also uh, with a hemianopia so that can be very risky in these patients so always gas in these patients so i'll be talking about tips and tricks ilm flaps and grafts so ilm flaps is about uh, a free flap or an inverted flap and also i'll be talking about retinal grafts um it's very important to have a very good case selection in these uh, patients i can uh, we have published this in ophthalmic surgery uh, laser imaging retina there are cases where you may want to go in straight for an inverted flap like this um, large macular hole with retinal detachment uh, the patient was relatively one eyed also and we did uh, in 2015 an inverted flap got a nice closure but then uh, there are some cases where in this case uh, uh, the hole is not closed after a vitrectomy so the patient already has a macular hole we did ilm peeling but it did not close and uh, these are the cases where you uh, have to take a decision about uh, resurgery and what kind of resurgery do you want to do there are so many options uh, i mean there is no dearth of kind of Uh, tissues which you can put inside the macular hole ilm capsule lens capsule you have amniotic membrane you have fibrin glue you have serum you have blood uh, tgf beta all all kinds of stuff are available so it, it's a question of whether you want to go in or just do a simple additional peeling of the ilm just increase the area of ilm peeling and put gas and give the patient a a face down position so these are all the options which you have uh, and then it's uh, it's about uh, what outcome do you expect in these patients after the surgery so why i have stopped here is that if you see this macular hole which has not closed in panel b is that one of the edges is still lifted has a lot of edema and so this patient has a good prognosis for closure but if you have a patient who has only flat edges all around uh, then you may probably just by peeling the ilm uh, and additional gas may not work you may want to have to really go in for some kind of a flap or some tissue plugging the hole if the whole edge is absolutely flat but if there is a whole edge is edematous then you may even consider a simple additional uh, uh, ilm peeling if uh, beyond the arcade and gas so this is the case this is a case where you have a flat edge and you may want to go in for a uh uh ilm flap or a free flap and just plug the hole but there are it's not easy you will have to find an area uh, and also this can uh, dislocate dislodge during fluid air exchange so those can be a, a problem in this case of free flap then inverted ilm flap is always an option especially for large macular holes in india at least uh, compared to the west uh, we see a lot of patients with large macular holes and this one is uh, close to 1000 microns so usually i go in for an inverted flap primary procedure in such large macular holes i don't i don't really stuff it it inside the macular hole i just uh, do a large ilm uh, and then trim it with a cutter and then make sure that it gets inverted to a fluid air exchange and then uh, give face down position it's not necessary to stuff the uh, ilm inside the macular hole and then this this is a patient of a retinal graft which uh, i have take i'm taking uh, the graft and i've done laser before the taking the uh, retina there are blood vessels which can be near the arcade uh, i i tried to do it under uh, pfcl but unfortunately with pfcl it didn't go in so i removed the pfcl and then the other problem with this uh, retinal graft is sometimes it gets stuck to the forceps it, you have to really uh, do it as a by manual to try to put and then it can get displaced too even during the fluid air exchange can get displaced after the surgery when you give the patient face down position it can get displaced so these are the other complications which you can have so the tip is i do my best in webinars but the trick is i avoid ilm free flaps in retinal grafts so as dr lalit verma mentioned during the beginning of the webinar while we may show many uh, things uh, which we do uh, but in ultimately in the patient's interest whatever is the best interest we need to do and also what are our limitations as surgeons if in my hand something doesn't work 
you don't have to do it just because someone else is doing it and if you are not comfortable with some procedure it's best to avoid those kind of procedures so with that i'll stop my presentation here dr motada the the two issues here one is uh, the placement of that uh, tissue whether it is amniotic membrane whether it is ilm graft or lens capsule or retinal tissue so people find difficulty in placement so people use it in the pfcl people you know put uh, visco over it and second issue is always that air flow exchange so can you throw light on these two issues doctor hasan is there he was there he is muted yeah i, I think, I think he is coming. okay yeah yeah um, so these two issues are, we thought we'll uh, you know ask you to comment about yes um first uh, if it is a, a recurrent case i mean macular hole after previous surgery um this is one entity and if it is a large myopic macular hole that underwent that underwent no previous surgery for example a large traumatic macular hole and if it, if it, the patient underwent previous surgery i start again by staining for the ilm if there is ilm then i will do an ilm inverted flap multi layer inverted flap mm -hmm. and i peel the ilm to the periphery in order to induce more relaxation of the underlying retina if there is no ilm and then i would do an autologous uh, free uh, neurosensory retinal flap but unlike what was shown um, i usually fashion a large um, retinal graft under pfcl so i inject pfcl i cut the retina under pfcl and then i drag the autologous retinal graft under pf cell because if you try to elevate the graft then it will be very difficult to immerse it again under the pf cell so you have to cut it drag it under pf cell flushing or a tangential with the surface of the retina until it reaches the uh, macular hole and then it is left over and then you may exchange the pfcl with air or with uh, silicon oil according to the case it has to be a little bit larger than <coughs> the flap shown because if it is small uh, it may not stay in place you should not use visco uh, elastic sub you cannot should not use helium because if you use helium to cover the flap helium will migrate under the flap and over the flap and then it will be very difficult to manipulate the flap because you are um, catching a flap over a slippery uh, slippery surface and uh, it is also difficult to remove the uh, helium um, by suction without endangering the flap so the best is to have a large retinal flap Uh, not less than one and a half disc diameter. Drag it under PFCL until it is placed over the uh, macular hole. Um, sometimes, I, if if it is uh, the patient is highly myopic, there is no healthy retina. I may use amniotic membrane uh, graft, whether it is a preserved amniotic membrane graft or um, a fresh. amniotic membrane graft but usually i start by uh, multi layer eye lens flap professor i think uh, with this uh, we i hand over the mic to dr brinder agarwal for inviting our guest uh, faculty Give thank you. you sir thank you sir it is my pleasure to invite professor hasan amortada he is from egypt you all know he is a graduate post graduate and now the professor emeritus of the cairo university egypt since 2015 it is a great achievement that for last 7 5 years he is a professor emeritus and he has been all through to the cairo university from graduate to post graduate then all various post 
and he was lucky to have the retina fellowship through uh, department of ophthalmology elionis university under supervision of professor golam peman and he is having a special interest in the proliferative diabetic retinopathy vitreo retinal interface disorders pediatric retinal derangement macular translocation myopic traction maculopathy giant retinal tears proliferative vitreo retinopathy and he has been member and on various post of all the societies of the egyptian vitreo retinal society and general ophthalmology society he had been invited as a guest speaker by the many international societies few to name romanian ophthalmic society jordanian ophthalmic society syrian ophthalmic society qatar ophthalmic society brazilian ophthalmic society greek ophthalmic society russian ophthalmic society and there are so many on and he has been a great speaker on the frankfurt retina meeting which is a very well known and very reputed meeting of the ophthalmic society and now we are lucky to have him in the jaipur ophthalmic society as a guest speaker he has many publications in the variety of journals which are peer reviewed on various vitreo retinal disorders so we are lucky to have professor hasana motada today in our own society meeting we are having a special meeting of retina live through jaipur ophthalmic society every year this year we are not able to have it on physical meeting so we are having a virtual meeting and retina live is usually having a live surgeries on variety of various disorders of retina and we are lucky to have all the star wars of india has performed surgery live from jaipur but this time we are having on the discussion so over to dr motada for his talk thank you very much um, i'm really honored and privileged to join this webinar of the jaipur ophthalmological society and to tell you the truth that um, i really um, uh, very fond of your country and the people um uh, of india and the culture of india and uh, i usually feel that um, it is very close to the um to the egyptian um, culture and the people of egypt so um thank you again and um my presentation is about um the myopic can you can you see my my screen Yes, yes it is visible okay okay um my my presentation is about myopic um, traction maculopathies but i have changed the title a little bit so i would like to stress on the vitreous cases and retinous cases in pathological myopia because this is uh, one of the reasons behind this um, clinical entity so if um, we are going to start what is going um, what is occurring in the posterior pole of the myopic uh, in eyes with pathological myopia so there is aberrant partially detached posterior hyaloid with traction and with or without vitreous cases or splitting of the posterior cortical layer what we call the anomalous posterior vitreous detachment um, the eye lamp in Uh, pathological myopia is altered and is very rigid and uh, it is believed to be the most rigid structure at the posterior pole of these eyes what is also rigid is the retinal arterioles and this has been described in the literature literature by many authors and then the progression of the posterior staphyloma these are the forces acting on the um, myopic posterior pole theoretically um, we can come to a mechanism for myopic fovea schisis it is a battle between rigid and flexible structures at the posterior pole the rigid structures as we have said is the posterior hyaloid the epiretinal membranes the eye lamp and the inner retina with the rigid vessels and they sorry and they and these uh, structures tend to pull the retina toward the center of the uh, of the eye and the outer retina choroid rpe and the sclera these are the flexible structures and we all know about the progressive elongation 
of the uh, myopic eyes, whether anteroposterior and sometimes um, transversely um, in these eyes. And this act to, um, act to pull the retina um, or to pull these structures away from the overlying retina. The spectrum of myopic traction maculopathies includes myopic macular hole without retinal detachment, myopic macular retinoschisis, and myopic macular hole with retinal detachment. Sir, you are not audible. Are, I'm not audible. Yeah, we yes. can hear you. Achha, I can hear. Yeah, we, we can, can hear here. Yeah, we can. I can also hear. Okay, okay. Yeah. Should I go on? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, okay. Um, these are not separate entities, but um, they can um, transfer from one entity to the other. So if we look at this patient uh, that was, uh, this is the OCT in 2011, the patient had uh, AP retinal membrane and partial, PV, partial PVD. Later on, he developed, the patient developed this flat macular hole. And then later on, with some traction, increase, increasing traction, the macular hole uh, becomes uh, larger. And then um, six months later, the patient developed a myopic macular hole retina detachment. So one type of myopic traction maculopathy can pass into the others. So they are not completely separate entities. I will start by talking about myopic uh, foveous cases. Um, what, when we should operate on eyes with myopic foveous cases, Let's have a look on this patient. In November 2014, there was a inner layer uh, retinoschisis, but the macula was attached and the patient was asymptomatic and the patient refused doing any uh, surgery. And later on, on March 2015, the patient started to develop diminution of vision, distorted vision, and the traction increased and the macula became detached. So the indication for surgery is macular threatening or macular detachment. And this can only be detected by regularly performed um, OCT. Uh, the patient should check his central vision with the Amsler grid and should notice his reading vision. Once there is symptoms the patient should report, should be examined, OCT should be performed, and the patient should undergo surgery. Let's have a look on this, another um, patient. In um, um, 2017, there was a schesis, but the photoreceptors are still attached. Although the OCT picture is striking, but this patient is still asymptomatic. And by the end of 2018, there was detachment of the photoreceptors and the patient start to symptomatize. So um, the patient presented with um, macular detachment and the patient underwent vitrectomy, posterior hyaloid peeling fovea sparing eye lamp peeling over the posterior pole, and this is an air injection, and this is the final result. So this is a patient with uh, myopic foveous thesis, and um, by the way, the other eye of this patient um, had a macular, a myopic macular hole detachment. Um, so I started by staining with trinsen alone, and it is indispensable um, to use um, transin alone to have a look on the posterior cortical vitreous to look for splitting of the um, retinal, the, the, the posterior cortical layers. Here, the probe is used to detach the posterior hyaloid, and um, this should be done gently and cautiously 
trying to elevate the posterior hyaloid until it is elevated from the surface of the retina. And then it is peeled to the posterior border of the vitreous uh, base or as far peripheral as can safely be done. So you have to see the peripheral part of what you are peeling. And then the eye lamb is started to be um, uh, stained. This is the brilliant blue assisted eye lamb uh, peeling, trying to fashion the flap. This is a multi-layer, I'm, tr I'm trying to fashion a multi-layer flap or what I call the envelope technique because you will see we are going to fold the eye lamb flaps like an envelope. So, and this is um, done from all the sides. This serves to peel the eye lamb from the edge uh, or to the edge of the staphyloma, thus uh, decreasing the effect, the rigid effect of the eye lamb on the underlying retina and mobilizing the underlying retina. And once the flaps are created, um, it is brought over the fovea and um, sometimes bleeding occurs occur, uh, while peeling the eye lamb under PFCL, although there was no hole, but I tried, I decided to uh, put the flaps over in order to strengthen the um, fovea. Uh, this is the preoperative with the macula of detachment. And this is one month after the um, uh, fovea sparing eye lamb uh, peeling. And um, air was used in this case. This is again a case of uh, myopic foveoschesis. Um, there was a myopic, um, I'm sorry, a lamellar macular hole uh, seen here. And I injected brilliant blue and it started to peel the, um, this, this, this is a membrane and not um, the eye lamb. And you can know that from the texture of the uh, eye lamb, of the, uh, the structure peeled. And um, the membrane is peeled over the posterior pole and um, removed. And you have to be uh, also very slow and um, trying to um, allow the tissue to relax after exerting the traction. Another injection of brilliant blue revealed the presence of the actual internal limiting membrane. And fovea sparing ILM uh, was performed just as the um, previous case. My advice is that once you feel that you are not seeing the internal limiting membrane or the stain is faint, um, you should restain in order to uh, augment the um, staining of the internal limiting membrane. And you have to be uh, slow, as I said, until the internal limiting membrane is brought over the uh, fovea. And then again, air was used. This is the preoperative. This is the lamellar hole. The retina uh, became attached and uh, the lamellar hole is closed with improvement in the visual acuity. This is a case of um, a more si a simple case of uh, myopic foveoschesis. Again, uh, fovea sparing eye lamb was performed starting um, from the temporal vascular arcades, moving toward the um, fovea, stopping at least 500 microns from the edge of the fovea. And bringing um, 
the ILM over the fovea and performing fovea sparing um, ILM. Well, this is not enough to relax the posterior retina. So we started, we started to peel the internal limiting membrane till the edge of the staphyloma and then trimming of the, um, of the ILM under PFCL is injected in order to um, preserve or keep the ILM stable, base vitrectomy, and then fluid air exchange. And this is the uh, post-operative. There was restoration of the foveal contour and the vision improved to 0 0.4. Progressive um, retinal reattachment. This is with the case uh, started, with, started with this uh, OCT. There was a foveal detachment, so we decided to operate. Um, three months later, there was still subretinal fluid, and I was about to um, put a macular buckle, but I decided to wait for some time. And after seven months, the macula became reattached and the vision improved, and there was no need to put a macular buckle. So to summarize the surgical technique in myopic uh, fulvius cases, the rigid ILM is peeled across the posterior staphyloma, reaching to the edge of the staphyloma for three, six degrees. It is difficult to peel across the edge of the staphyloma. This increases the flexibility of the retina. The retina can conform to the shape of the staphyloma and the retina may be able to adapt to further elongation of the sclera. So phobia sparing ILM eliminates the post-operative risk of macular hole formation. What happened if we peeled the ILM over the macula? I did this case. This was a severely myopic 41 year old female. I did an ILM peeling and removal and I was punished by um, the occurrence of macular hole and um, the hole underwent progressive enlargement and the patient, uh, uh, although at the beginning she had uh, improved in the visual acuity, but the vision started to diminish. So I decided to perform um, a uh, autologous free neurosensory uh, retinal flap. So the thermi was gently applied and this PA, under PFCL, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the flap is dragged under PFCL slowly along the surface of the retina, never elevates the flap tangential to the surface of the retina and it is brought to the, um, over the macular hole. And this is the post-operative picture. The vision improved. The, this is the, the flap. And um, you can see that there is a cleavage between the retinal flap and the underlying retina. And according to this OCT, the hole has decreased in size, um, but it is still open, but the vision improved. So um, fovea sparing ILM uh, peeling should be the treatment of myopic foveus cases. We move to the second entity, which is myopic macular hole without retinal detachment. And we have two types, idiopathic macular hole in a myopic eye and macular hole complicating myopic foveus cases. This is the uh, first type, um, myopic macular hole complicating uh, foveus cases. The, the posterior hyaloid was uh, peeled, um, triumphant assisted, and um, then the uh, brilliant blue is uh, used to stain the internal limiting membrane. And then um, again, it is, I start, at that time I was using the tan scraper to create the flap but I stopped using this technique and the uh, internal limiting membrane 
is peeled toward the uh, macular hole, trying to create multiple uh, flaps. This is the, um, the flaps stopping at, as I said, 500 micron from the edge of the um, macular hole. And then the, um, the island is peeled uh, more peripherally in order to mobilize the underlying retina. And then base vitrectomy was performed and the eye was filled with air, no gas and not, no silicon oil. And under air, um, the flap was brought over the macular hole using the um, soft tan scraper. This is the post-operative picture. There is flat, the macular hole is flat, closed with there are attempts at restoration of the ellipsoid zone and the vision improved to 0 0.4. This uh, patient is a highly myopic patient with a myopic macular hole. And uh, the patient also has paravascular two holes, denoting that there is traction um, along, uh, along the paravascular area. The posterior hyoid was peeled and then the internal limiting membrane was um, cre uh, peeled, creating flaps, also starting from the um, lower temporal arcade, um, moving toward the uh, macular hole until we created multi-layer flap over the hole. And under PFCL, the ILM was brought um, over the macular hole. And this is the final picture. Again, air was used to tamponade the macular hole. And this is the post-operative picture. The uh, hole is closed with uh, good functional and anatomical results. Um, this is the, again, a case of my, my, uh, macular hole complicating myopic foveous cases and um, the technique of um, multi-layer flap or envelope technique was used. Here is the U-shaped um, healing of the macular hole. The vision improved to 0 0.6 and this patient um, could read. Myopic macular hole retina detachment, and again, we have uh, clinically two types, retina detachment confined to the posterior staphyloma and retina detachment extending to the periphery. We start with the first type. This is a patient with a macular hole retina detachment confined to the posterior staphyloma. Their um, posterior hyaloid was peeled and the internal limiting membrane was started to peel um, after creating a flap with the uh, tan scraper. And then the flap, the ILM was peeled toward the, always working toward the macular hole. Until the, uh, the flap is re-injection of the uh, brilliant blue to augment the stain and um, the flaps are brought over the macular hole and then working uh, to peel the internal limiting membrane to the uh, periphery till we reach the edge of the posterior staphyloma in order to uh, mobilize and relax the underlying retina. And then under air, the vision, the, the, the macular hole closed, the retina is attached and vision improved to 0 0.3. Uh, 
this is maybe a, a, a interesting case with a macular, large macular hole developing over an area of Fuchs spot. The posterior hyoid was strongly attached. I tried to peel it um, gently, always um, keeping an eye on the underlying retina. So once there is a spot of bleeding, you should stop uh, peeling the posterior hyaloid because if you try to peel the posterior hyaloid more, then you will create a, a retinal break. And then moving to the periphery, the posterior hyaloid was uh, peeled and then um, brilliant blue was injected. And in this case, I was, I found it is difficult to peel the uh, internal limiting membrane with the detached retina. So I decided to peel it under uh, PFCL. The macular hole was large and at what at one uh, at one time i thought of um, creating uh, autologous retinal graft but i um, uh, decided to give the internal limiting membrane uh, uh, the first chance so the internal limiting membrane was brought over the macular hole from different directions and um, finally i could have a good amount of um, eye lamp over the uh, hole. And in this, uh, because this was one eye patient, I inject the patient with silicone oil. And this is after silicone oil removal, the vision improved to 0 0.16. This is a difficult case um, because of the posterior hyaloid was strongly adherent and there was paravascular multiple paravascular breaks with strong traction along the, um, the blood vessels. So uh, I tried to uh, peel the posterior hyaloid or the membrane ad adherent to the paravascular retina. Um, I could have been uh, to trim it, but finally it came away. And as you see, there are multiple layers of posterior hyaloid uh, or vitreous pieces. So you have, you may have to inject triencinolone um, several times in order to stain the sciatic uh, posterior cortical vitreous. And you have to uh, remove the posterior hyaloid um, completely, moving from the center to the periphery until it is uh, removed. So in this way, we um, remove the, um, the first um, scaffold exerting uh, traction. And then under PFCL, because it was impossible to peel the internal limiting membrane without attaching the retina. So PFCL was injected to re reattach the retina and under PFCL, the uh, eye lamp was peeled and brought over the, uh, the macular hole. Again, using a multi-layer uh, technique and then trying to move to peel the eye lamp to the periphery and this eye was uh, filled with silicon oil. Base vitrectomy was performed. And then silicon oil was injected. And this is the picture at the time of silicon oil removal. The retina is attached and stable. Uh, this is a, 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 a recurrent macular hole, myopic macular hole detachment. Um, after a previous buckle, and you can see that the buckle was a very high buckle. What I am peeling now, this is a, an epiretinal membrane and not the 
um, and not the internal limiting membrane, re-injecting brilliant blue, and then peeling the um, internal limiting membrane. Again, always peeled from the periphery to the center, stopping 500 microns from the edge of the hole. and um, peeling till the edge of the staphyloma, re-augmenting the dye, and then complete the peeling of the now well-stained internal limiting membrane, and then under PFCL, the retina was attached, the ILM was brought uh, over the macular hole. And then a small retinotomy was created to drain the subretinal fluid completely. Laser was applied and finally the eye was filled with silicon oil. This is the, at the time of silicon oil removal, the uh, retina is attached and um, these are different OCTs. OCT uh, done at different intervals. And um, this patient was very lucky. This was the one, uh, this is the last eye of this patient. The vision improved to 0 0.6 and the patient um, could uh, read. So um, take home message or stay home message because um, we are at the time of the COVID-19 Anomalous PVD, vitreoschisis, rigid ILM, posterior staphyloma are the main factors contributing to the tractional forces acting on the posterior pole in pathological myopia and resulting in a wide range of clinical entities. The use of transnalone to highlight the vitreous gel is indispensable for visualizing the visual layers, cortical vitreous adhering to the retinal surface. And ILM is definitely uh, uh, and proved pathologically to be the um, main scaffold for cellular proliferation. So it is the most rigid structure at the posterior pole. So it is a pathological ILM, stained ILM, uh, and it's feeling to the edge of the posterior staphyloma, increases the flexibility of the retina and thus can conform to the shape of the staphyloma. Fovea sparing ILM peeling is the treatment of choice for myopic phobioschisis, multi-layer ILM flap technique, or what I call the envelope technique is the, uh, I think, uh, a very good technique for macular hole, myopic macular holes without, with and without retina detachment. I think that macular buckling is rarely needed nowadays and free autologous um, neurosensor retinal flap or amniotic membrane graft um, are better preserved for cases with already peeled um, ILM. And um, this is all um, what I can say about uh, myopic phobius cases. I hope it is, um, it, it, it answered uh, many of the questions about this important uh, clinical entity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Motada, for showing uh, wonderful videos as usual. And there has been a uh, lot of learning from your videos. And, learning videos. And yeah, and all of us uh, feel more confident, uh, you know, after seeing your videos. You see, one question was that you have shown three kind of entities. And you very nicely explained the rigid retina and the flexible retina that concept actually got uh, ingrained in my mind. And the, all the three scenarios, whether it is schesis, hole without RD, or with RD, steps of surgery are by and large similar. That is careful PVD, uh, re-injecting triamcinolone, and uh, to stain uh, posterior cortical vitreous, multi-layered flap, and, and, uh, and air. And you emphasize air, you no know, gas uh, to be used in surgery. So is there is this surgery different in three kind of scenarios or is by and similar? No, I think uh, uh, the surgery in the three clinical entities is the same because uh, we are dealing with 
um, uh, a major or a main causative factor, that is the rigid eye lamp. This yeah. is, so when you peel the eye lamp and when you use the eye lamp um, to provide a scaffold for the proliferation of molar cells that will help closure of the hole, then you will solve the problem. If um, you have failure after doing this, then you have to perform um, a macular buckle. Uh, but believe me, in doing many cases, um, I did not find a case that need a macular buckle after several years of follow-up. So um, the need for the macular buckle may be before the era of eye lamp peeling and eye lamp flap uh, technique. But with the, with the technique of peeling to the edge of the staphyloma to relax the underlying retina, creating a flap to cover the macular hole and assist in its healing as mentioned and uh, described um, by um, um, our dear friend uh, from Poland. Um, so I think this can solve many of the problems um, in the science. Why did you emphasize that ILM uh, multi-led flap has to be left short of 500 microns? What is the yeah, rationale of stopping yeah. at below uh, 500? Yes, because if you feel it to the very edge of the hole, you may, um, you, the, the flap may, the flap. may be lost, may be cut. It may be lost. So you have to preserve the flap. Also, I inject PFCL while doing base vitrectomy because if you are doing base vitrectomy, there is current inside the eye, fluid current. And this fluid current may detach the flap from the hole. Yes. So you have to inject PFCL um, to keep the eye lamp flap over the macular hole, then do your base vitrectomy. And then after finishing the whole surgery, you fashion the flap, you, you replace the flap over the hole, and <clears throat> you perform um, either flu, uh, PFCL air or PFCL silicon exchange, depending on um, the severity and the complexity of the case. Uh, uh, professor, uh, 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 sure, sure, uh, I want to ask you in a myopic macular hole eye or a myopic schesis eye, no presence of retinal detachment. Uh, is it necessary to always do base vitrectomy? Um, yes, I'm, a, I'm an old uh, vitreo retinal surgeon, so I learned a lot from um, Payman, I wrote a lot from uh, Zivanovich and from Mechner. And at that time, vitrectomy means complete vitrectomy. So I always insist on removing the vitreous base, even in macular, in simple idiopathic macular hole cases. But in myopic macular hole, um, uh, uh, myopic traction maculopathy, removing the vitreous gel from the periphery provide more volume. So you can inject more air inside yeah. the eye uh, without the need for injecting gas. And yes. um, as you all know, the, the, the size of the myopic eye is huge. And um, when you inject air, there, there will be a large volume of air. And air stays in these eyes at least for 10 and sometimes for 15 days. So there is, in these eyes, there is no need to use um, SF6 yes. or yes. gas or, or C3F8. And, and yes. um, I think C3F8 has no role in these cases. If no, are not um, hindering and the, the vision of the patient and increasing uh, the duration um, in which the patient cannot see. So um, uh, I think air is sufficient provided you injected the, uh, you remove the vitreous gel, the peripheral vitreous gel, and you inject a large amount of air. Thank you very much. My question was uh, like, uh, what was the need for injecting PFCL 
in a case of myopic phobioscisis uh, and when you uh, already did the uh, uh, phobia spreading ilm filling is it just to keep the ilm in the in a proper place to law so that that uh, the turbulence while doing the victor's base yeah. extension is happening is it only yes. for that purpose you are injecting pfcl okay. yes exactly for for this purpose in order to avoid detaching the ilm flaps while uh, okay. manipulating the vitreous base depressing and releasing the depression and uh, so on so um, i think uh, injecting few cc of uh, pfcl yes, over the macular area will keep will protect the flap and keep it in uh, in place so in such uh, high myopic eyes uh, while peeling at the posterior pole you use a contact system or a uh, or the wide angle system uh, no I, i'm using a non contact system and so, um, sir if you are uh, using a non contact system uh, does it happen to you that while peeling the rim of the the uh, the wide angle system you know touches with your forceps the handle of the forceps yeah, yes very good question um, the, there are certain precautions um, that you have to take um, while peeling the ilm because you are dealing with a, a long uh, an eye with a long axial length and in a posterior staphyloma so first of all you have to um, adapt the position of the patient head so as to bring the field uh, you are working at um, nearest to the forceps uh, second uh, you have to use forceps with um small hands with small handles so don't use uh, forceps with bulky handles because with the small handles especially the cross action uh, forceps you are not uh, they are not going to hit the edge of the non contact lens but if the handle is bulky then you are going to hit the uh, edge of the lens right third you may remove the um, the trocar um the, the 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 cannula the cannula, the cannula. so uh, this may add few cc or a few millimeters i mean uh, to your forceps i don't like to use the long forceps because uh, the longer the forceps the less you have control over the tip of the forceps um i think in this way uh, you can um, you I'm, i'm really i'm using Uh, what we what i what is produced by oculus it's called the high definition um, non contact lens it is used for both the macular work and the peripheral uh, work okay sir i'm also exactly using the same one and it really helps that yes if you focus it well in the beginning yes. of the surgery it stays in focus also yes and they, even now i'm using the um, the uh, ingenuity system and um, i'm i'm doing the same technique it it, it, it needs a, some training but um, finally you will uh, find yourself uh, capable of feeling the internal limiting membrane in the eyes but uh, this doesn't mean that the contact lens is a bad technique it may uh, in 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 some hands it may be um, the best technique so um you can use the non contact or the contact uh, lenses okay sir thank you so much so can i now uh, start my presentation okay i'll stop sharing yes sir okay Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. So thank you everybody. I'll be start I'll be uh, presenting a lamellar hole associated epiretinal proliferation LHEP in short. So it is uh, basically defined on OCT as a thick homogeneous material of medium reflectivity on the premacular surface the epiretinal surface and more specifically at the margins of the lamellar defects. it is typically in continuation with the middle retinal layers it conforms to the contour without exiting traction so it's a form of degenerative uh, erm rather than a tractional erm complex 
and they are thought to originate from the proliferation of muller cells as according to many studies onto the epiretinal surface so lamellar holes along with lhep are more likely to have larger tissue defects and uh, disruption of the ellipsoid zone and poorer mean visual acuity in uh, as according to many journals many literature search in the past decade so i'll be presenting two cases uh, two interesting cases one is uh, uh, this was a 65 year old gentleman with the uh, 20 by 80 vision in the right eye with a lamellar hole and a lamellar hole associated epiretinal proliferation as you can see it's quite clear in this there's a stark uh, uh, lamellar hole uh, epiretinal proliferation on the nasal aspect as well as slight uh, lhep component on the temporal aspect also along with the ellipsoid zone disruption so we operated the patient the patient had a multifocal iol uh, in place and uh, uh, i'm stressing the point here that uh, we have to be prepared uh, about the diagnosis because these are not routine cases as opposed to the routine lamellar hole surgeries or macular hole surgeries they take time and the membrane is quite tenacious and it's very difficult to remove so you require a lot of patience and if you know in your mind that what you're dealing with the you know things can become very easy uh, intraoperatively so this was the pvd induction the pvd was always uh, was already there and then we had the staining with the bbg dye now you can see the negative staining in the center and the blue staining around the periphery and the the stark point is the negative staining as opposed to the erm is of a very limited area it's generally at the edge of the lamellar defect the second point is uh, uh, routinely if you want to peel a erm Uh, you would go from the ilm uh, you know area and you know just peel off the erm along with it but here the the membrane is so thick and embedded into the retinal tissue that the that the ilm actually you know shears off at the edge of the ilm and the lhep area now you can see uh, with patients you can get a cleavage plane uh, after trying and retrying grasping and grasping gently and that the contour the texture is you know very tenacious it's glial tissue it's yellowish in color and it is very very adherent to the edges of the hole so you have to be careful you might not remove it in one piece and you might have to do a piece mill you know removal of it but you have to be very gentle while removing it because it can evolve the hole and enlarge the hole as you can see the the yellowish membrane uh, is being removed over the lamellar hole in multiple attempts and this of course is a edited video but it takes a lot of time to identify the plane again restaining you do and you can find the remnant uh, ILMs which have not been removed uh, along with the LHCP, and then you peel it uh, as much as you like and as much as you deem necessary, as per your case. And this case was then, uh, you know, uh, done routinely as other whole surgeries were done, and we went under air and put in SF6 gas. And after six months, uh, the patient had a very good uh, foveal contour. Uh, with some ellipsoid zone disruption still there but the patient improved to 6 12 parts vision best corrected the case too is very interesting because this is a common scenario we face and the patient presented with the bilateral uh, full thickness macular hole and uh, as it was a busy opd you you know the technician does uh, all the oct scans and you just have a cursory look the patient had you know both eye cataract also and the right eye cataract was a little more dense than the left eye cataract and the vision was finger counting 3 meters in the right eye and uh, i just saw the oct on the screen and it was a cube scan a macular cube scan and you can see uh, uh, on a gross look uh, uh, both eye had a macular hole and these holes with these elevated edges in the retinal edema generally do well they close well so i did not give it a second thought and i was confident i would go in the ot and do a routine macular hole surgery and come back in back in uh, maybe 30 minutes or 25 minutes but uh, here we miss the point because such uh, you know newer anomalies like lhcp are you know more evident when you do a high definition scan they can easily be missed on the cube scan and then uh, uh, when you overlook such uh, uh, small things uh, they can you know end up in big intraoperative surprises and frustration so when i looked uh, retrospectively in the left eye scan because the right eye hd scan was not very clear now you can see that there is a lhcp on the temporal border and a lhcp component on the nasal border of the macular at the edge of the macular hole so this was a case of a full thickness macular hole with lhcp and uh, we went for a combined 
uh, phacovitrectomy in these cases in this case but at this point i was still you know uh, unaware of the etiology and i was you know assuming that it would be a routine macular hole case so after inserting the iol and uh, securing all the ports uh, we went inside and you know did a core vitrectomy did pvd induction uh, in this case without uh, staining with a tricord you can see the vesicling coming off the disc now staining with the bbg again uh, as in the previous case there is a central negative stain similar to what we find in the erm staining also but it's more confined dot at the center and you can see the sheen while i'm uh, you know removing it at the posterior pole the sheen of the lhab and it is unlike the erm sheen you know which 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 is actually over the retina and has a definite cleavage plane here you do not find the cleavage plane because it is embedded into the retinal layers again you try from the ilm surface from the ilm stained area towards the center but it shears off at the edge so you have to you know keep peeling on over the unstained area over the negative stain in the hope that with grasp and regrasp you will finally get hold of a edge and once you get that then the things become easy and you can remove the you know the the epithelial tissue over the hole uh, successfully like now at the supra uh, nasal part we found that uh, nick and the cleavage plane and now it becomes easy because when it is once it is folded over itself you can make out the you know contour the texture the yellowish hue of the of the glial tissue uh, similarly as in the previous case you can see this yellowish membrane is stuck you know it's very adherent to the edge of the hole and this is where you have to take care you have to be very gentle some people have advocated inverting the the epithelial tissue and the ilm inside the hole but uh, uh, what i do is you just uh, i just remove it gently uh you know circumferentially over the hole just taking care not to enlarge the hole not to evolve the hole or to create a iatrogenic uh, hole so as you can see the whole complex the whole glial tissue complex the homogeneous complex is coming out of around the circumferentially around the hole of course it does not come in one piece and you have to you know grasp and regrasp and after that has been done you restain it with bbg and uh, in this case we were happy to find two beautiful leaflets of ilm still remaining and we made full use of those leaflets and you just you know we just you know inverted it over the the hole and that was sufficient you know to cover the hole uh, no stuffing done here and we went under air and put in sf6 gas so this was a case in which i was you know uh, Uh, i was expecting a routine surgery but because i overlooked the oct scan so never do a macular cube scans in this case of low resolution they are fast scans but they overlook they miss the finer points of the oct and it's very it's very necessary to you know thoroughly pre um, pre evaluate every macular hole case to find such phenomenon which is not very rare and these are the post op pictures one week post op and this is a three month post op and a uh, nice hole closure so to summarize lhcp progressively increases Uh, as in literature uh, both over the nasal and the temporal edges and the horizontal diameter increases with time and the elithoid layer changes also appear with time but the important point is pre operative detection is important for tackling intra operative surprises and these can be very frustrating while you are operating if you are not prepared for it thank you thank you thank you vishal for uh, wonderful uh, videos of uh, this entity lhcp uh, any comments from any of the panelists like i i have a question to vishal can it be a macular hole associated epiretinal polyfiltration in the uh, your case last case you are showing yeah that was one. a full thickness macular hole with the epiretinal polyfiltration so lhcp is described with a full thickness macular holes also now yeah. initially it was you know uh with uh, lamellar holes only but now the recent literature says almost 10% are associated with full thickness macular holes also and these are really you know tricky professor hasan you have we have seen it and labeled it as an erm with macular hole yeah so uh, vishal why do you call it as lamellar hole associated uh, with the sir because initially the nomenclature started with the lamellar hole now it, actually it is a epiretinal proliferation but yes. uh, 
because initially full thickness and macular holes were not you know reported to be associated with it but now there are many reports of full thickness also being associated with the epidermal proliferation so vishal but, can you can you stain this uh, you know eyes initially after you peel off the phf uh, using using reti blue or uh, trepan blue sir they uh, unlike the normal uh, tractional urns they stain very poorly with trepan blue also okay so uh, you see i have sometimes stained this uh, and still i agree that staining with uh, even with higher concentration of trepan blue it does not take it just shows the picture of negative staining yes, so anybody Dr. else you, you wanted to make a comment dr hosen sangeet any comment so i think this um can i have comment on yes yes dr hasan um uh, as you said uh, it was first described for lamellar macular holes and um, as you know lamellar holes are now classified into uh, degenerative and uh, tractional and um, the, um, the what you are describing is the degenerative type there is no traction uh, in the case and there usually it looks like the englishman uh, hat um, but what i differ from what you are doing is that i do not remove the yellow tissue okay um, uh, i because it is a part of the retina this is molar cells uh, so what i am doing is that i peel it and then i put it again inside the hole okay because i don't like to remove parts of the of the um, of the um, of the retina of the uh, his, of the of the retina so uh, i think there is no need to remove the yellow tissue the yellow tissue is peeled and then it is put inside the hole and in these eyes usually i do a flap technique so i put the yellow tissue inside the hole and then i cover it with the uh I with the eye lamp with the eye lamp flap and yes, um uh, sometimes the the the, the macular the lamellar hole is so degenerated as you said and usually the visual results are much less than uh, in the tractional type uh, so in this degenerative type the visual results are poor um, and the routine cases yeah with the tractional type agreed sir that's right so one thing we can do is like we start the ilm peeling from the where the stain is there and then you uh, can come inside from like outside inside technique that's what i told you sir when actually it's so adherent when you come to the unstained part it, uh, the ilm generally shears off so mm -hmm. it's unlike the tractional urns where it lifts the urm also along with it so it's not that uh, it's not the same actually Okay. I think we'll move on uh, to Dr. Borel sure. for his presentation yes. on uh, submacular hemorrhage uh, management. Yes, uh, yes, thank you, Jaipur Doctor Nandika Society, for giving me the opportunity to present in your uh, webinar. Uh, my topic is uh, submacular hemorrhage management. The we know the principal causes of submacular hemorrhage: it's AMD, PCV, macular aneurysm, trauma, and blood dyskinesis. The usual prognosis of the submacular hemorrhage is very poor. Retinal damage can occur as early as within 24 hours because of the barrier effect, toxicity of the iron and hemosiderin, uh, iron uh, fibrin infiltration, sharing of the outer segments and ultimately fibrotic scar formation. So windows of opportunity is within first two weeks of onset of submacular hemorrhage. All the treatment strategies depends on the two most important factors, that is the size of the macular hole, number two, duration of the hemorrhage. So if it is small size, less than 4 dx diameters, uh, suppose in this case, one to 4 dx diameter, less than two weeks duration. So in these cases, anti vgf injection, if it is uh, from CNVM or it, uh, if it is traumatic in origin, pneumodisplacement is enough to clear of the hemorrhage and uh, for the improvement of the vision. Like uh, if it is medium size, that is more than 4 dx diameter, but not extending beyond the temporal vascular arcuate, and the duration is two to four weeks, it is the 
the question uh, the role of tpa subretinal tpa is coming at the uh, many studies already showed that subretinal tpa versus and uh, versus uh, intravitreal tpa uh, role uh, that is subretinal has a definite more advantages than the intravitreal tpa and this is the uh, this is the ideal situation in this picture you can see the 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 height of the uh, hemorrhage is just above the fovea this is the most ideal picture uh, scenario for uh, going for the subretinal TP injection, massive subcovial, thick uh, uh, hemorrhage subretinal should be just above the macular area, and usually the uh, recombinant uh, TPA uh, we are using as in like, like active, active lactylize or uh, 20 milligram uh, to be in 20 ml to be dissolved in 20 ml of the sterile water for injection and take the 550 microgram in the 0 0.05 ml that is the dose usual dose you can go up to the 100 microgram but not especially you should avoid the higher doses to prevent systemic toxicity like in this case of submacular sub ilm hemorrhage combination because of macro aneurysms you can see the sub ilm and sub retinal hemorrhage submacular hemorrhage and uh, here i am uh, uh, after doing vitrectomy and pvd induction i uh, stain the ilm with bvg dye and then uh, peeling the ilm with the help of forceps just to release the trap sub ilm hemorrhage then using 41 gauge metallic uh, needle, uh, subretinal needle to uh, inject subretinal TPA and just only subretinal TPA and do fluid exchange and SF6 gas injection. And after three weeks of surgery, you can see beautifully uh, there is no sub ilm hemorrhage, no uh, subretinal hemorrhage. Retina is absolutely flat and vision is equal to 6 by 12 on Snellens chart. Now, uh, it's a combination of sub neurosensory and sub RP hemorrhage in most of the heart and uh, practice, routine practice. Uh, we are seeing this kind of situation. Vision is finger counting close to face. We are accurate. And here, uh, the, uh, we are using cocktail of subretinal TPA, antifagem, and air injection. That is here after doing vitrectomy and PVD injection, I'm injecting sub-retinal, sub neurosensitive retinal, uh, uh, RTPA. Uh, and you can see the wave of uh, this thing. And again, uh, injecting the uh, sub uh, RPA, PED, uh, TPA. This usually we are not recommending sub uh, PED, TPA because uh, to prevent uh, systemic toxicity. Now I'm using combination of anti and air injection sub-retinally and we uh, do fluid exchange with uh, and post operatively you can see the, the vision improved to 6 by 18 and uh, the whole uh, PED and sub neurosense retinal uh, hematology is completely dissolved. Like it's, uh, it's another situation where I'm planning for the uh, subretinal blood removal because the subretinal hemorrhage is quite extensive. Here I'm injecting subretinal TPA and waiting for something. Especially you can wait from 15 minutes to 45 minutes. Here, uh, more you wait, more you get more clot lysis. Now doing small retinotomy, it is uh, good to prevent further PVR formation. Now you can do one or two retinotomy, remove blood as much as possible. Uh, do fluid exchange and followed by uh, laser, then uh, injecting subretinal as uh, intravitreal uh, anti vagem injection followed by oil. And uh, postoperatively, you can see uh, after three weeks, vision improved a little bit, but after silicon removal, we actually vision improved to six by 18 on long term follow up. <laughs> this is uh, the uh, case of hemorrhage RD, that is the more extensive uh, data. The detached retina, whole retina is diffused, the hemorrhagic retina, uh, subretinal hemorrhage. In this situation, you have to be very careful regarding the during the vitrectomy. Like in this situation, you can see the blood is very sticky and it is altered to blood. It is altered color is probably brown in color. And this is, these are the special situation where you can get this kind of discolored hemorrhage. And uh, here, one in one or two or three quadrant, you can inject uh, with the subretinal TPA, but you should always mind the, uh, the maximum dose of the uh, subretinal TPA, then go for the uh, temporal retinectomy because the hemorrhage is quite extensive, more than almost total retinal detachment was there. And uh, now uh, you are removing all uh, the blood, then uh, injecting PFC to settle the retina to laser. And uh, uh, finally, uh, you are doing a silicon oil PFCL exchange by uh, using a uh, sandalized light, injecting silicon oil with the left hand and removing PFCL with the right hand. Like post operatively, you can get a very good result in this kind of situation. In this, uh, is a, like after two, uh, 10 months of post op, uh, 10 months post op, post test work, we shall improve the six by that is decently okay. Macula seems to be like uh, quite decent in uh, shape and uh, it starts uh, start functioning. 
and it's when you are uh, there is uh, you are planning for the uh, rp core duct transplantation because of the long standing hematoma already you are giving multiple injection of anti vegem like in this case i plan for the subretinal and uh, sub, uh, rp core patch graft transplantation autologous uh, from the same patient now you have to in, uh, do multiple sites uh, blob like elevation and the wave should go up to the uh, over the macular area like uh, in this case where the retina is already elevated like in this case of hemorrhagic detachment uh try to do the uh, retinectomy uh, peripheral, uh, peripheral retinectomy as close to the oral serata as possible and remove the subretinal blood now uh, as uh, because the most of the situation of blood is uh, very much clotted in this situation i have not used uh, subretinal tpa you may use subretinal tpa to uh, promote the clot lysis and finally uh, remove all the blood and where the uh, there is a subretinal flesh in neovascular membrane you can see in the case of pcv you can see the uh, flesh in neovascular membrane partially scarred uh, be careful using tano scratcher also i am just gently separating the, the membrane from the detached retina remove all the uh, membrane membrane part uh, to prevent further hemorrhage now from the bleeding for the feeder vessels to be cauterized uh, gently uh, to prevent further uh, hemorrhage and now uh, your uh, your next step is uh, for doing the rp core at patch graft transplantation from a relatively healthier looking area uh, if you cannot do the pre operative autoclusions uh, you have to be uh, like on table you have to decide inject the pscl under the need the pscl uh, with the help of forceps try to uh, look at the graft over the proper site of the fovea now remove the graft alignment was done remove the removal of pfcl was done and now the uh, now the you are injecting uh, we are injecting uh, pfcl to reappose the uh, retina and fi uh, finally doing fluid exchange laser uh, followed by silicon oil pfcl exchange injecting pfcl silicon oil with the left hand and removing pfcl with the right hand under sample slide now you will get uh, this much of good result after silicon removal also patient gain 6 by 36 vision and you can see the graph gradually the graft edema is uh, decreasing and uh, post operatively now i am uh, highlighting one very interesting situation of presented presented with plpr uh, vision vitreous hemorrhage and massive subretinal hemorrhage where i plan to inject uh, rtpa 0.05 cc injection wait for some time well, one or two uh, sites of, uh, which you, i choose in you know, the maximum elevated area then again inject the subretinal anti vegem and filtered air 0.03 cc injection to include the exchange and injecting cpf gas after the, after uh, uh, that uh, seen the vision was gradually improved but again after 14 weeks patient presented with a massive recurrent uh, hemorrhage subretinal hemorrhage then i planned for the rp coroid patch graft transplantation uh, along with the removal of the this uh, subretinal hemorrhage uh, then uh, i'm doing the retinectomy creating giant retinal tear uh, as close to the oral serata as possible removing the subretinal blood and taking care of the uh, surrounding additions Uh, very carefully separate the, uh, and remove the scar the tissue and injecting pfcl uh, to separate the retinal flap and choosing an area of supratemporal quadrant or you can choose the infratemporal quadrant if the uh, if the area is uh, rp looking uh, is healthy in that side with the help of uh, two forceps under the pfcl you are translocating the graft uh, in the into the proper site of the fovea now graft alignment was done remove the pfcl and again uh, then uh, re uh, again reinvert the uh, retinal flap by injecting the pfcl again over line over the retina uh, and do fluid exchange uh, to reappose the retina and uh, do do uh, do nicely attached uh, and to laser uh, followed by uh, silicon oil uh, pfcl exchange at the end of surgery uh, now uh, posteriorly get a uh, good result vision improved to 6 by 60 and uh, the graft is nicely attached here uh, sub, uh, sub under the macula thank you thank you boral uh, you see i must say that last two surgeries were very very daring a lot of us uh, may not be performing those surgeries regularly any comments from anybody dr hosan about the last two uh, cases um well i i am doing um, well my first comment is how to inject the um, the tpa and um, the anti bgf and the air i i like to start outside the arcade 
because I like the wave of the subretinal fluid wow. to reach the macular area smoothly and gently, um, because if it is um, too, the pressure is, is high, yes. it may create a macular hole. Macular hole, so, yes. Yeah, yes, so I, I, I like to, to start injecting outside the, um, the posterior pool, outside the arcade. So and allow the fluid to uh, move gently toward the macular area. This is one point. Um, for the massive subretinal hemorrhage, uh, doing the um, the uh, choroidal graft, uh, the choroidal graft uh, technique, I don't like to apply many diathermy or heavy diathermy to the, especially to the retinal periphery because this area is a vascular. And um, cutting just posterior to the aura uh, will not produce bleeding. If bleeding occurs, then you can touch the bleeder vessel with, um, with the light diathermy. But um, there is no need to, um, to apply heavy diathermy uh, in the area to be cut. And then um, the, I, I usually um, uh, outline the area of the choroidal patch with laser and not with the with the with the laser. So um, uh, because it is less laser is less damaging to the uh, choroid, the um, RPE and uh, and um, usually I drag it under PFCL as you have shown and then I usually like to set, to have it well centralized over the macula, uh, over the um, uh, beneath the macula. I mean uh, the other. Uh, point is that you have to choose a healthy area of RPE and um, That's what choroid. I said. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, you did that. But um, uh, what I, I'm not doing like you is the diathermy, uh, the that application is. of, of diathermy. I think yeah, there is no need for all this diathermy. Uh, th this is, in my, in my opinion, what I'm doing. Till now, I did, uh, yes, I, till now, I did almost um, more than 50 cases, and two cases I faced macular hole. One patient presented with on table macular hole. I just did uh, only fluid exchange, drained the fluid from the macular hole, from, uh, macular hole and it was closed postoperatively. But in another case, I didn't realize the macular hole formation, and a patient came with the macular hole with detachment. That is the another mm -hmm. situation. Uh, in two cases, I faced macular hole. That's, uh, that's why you are telling this. You have to inject. Mm -hmm. yes. We are. And about, by the way, these holes are difficult to close. Yes. yes. Even if even if the eye lamp is there, so if you try to uh, perform an eye lamp flap, it it will not close easily, and yes. you may need uh, to put a, a retinal graft to close it. So um, so one ha one uh, has to be cautious uh, while injecting the subretinal uh, fluid and air and. Uh, this is my only yes, comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So, the, the one question Dr. about Dr. the similar, similar Dr. case. Okay, Dr. Shogit, please. Yeah. Uh, do you like to do a one-stage surgery, Subendu, or do you like to do a two-stage? Like, I inject 25 microgram with air bubble underneath the retina, 25 microgram in the vitreous cavity, do a FGE, and come out. And if I need to do a lavage, I go in after three days. Uh, do you like to wait in your operating room and then uh, drain the blood or do you like to do a two-stage procedure? Basically, I am not in favor of intravitreal injection of TPA. I am always uh, well doing no, the injection. Along with, along, I, along with, of course, subretinal and the air bubble goes in first. 25. Yes. Subretinal injection, after giving injection, if the blood clot is quite uh, a bit, if I am not draining it, I am just uh, finishing the surgery surgery on, on that uh, after injecting the PPA. But if I'm planning to drain the blood, then I have to wait for at least 15 to 20 minutes. After 15 to 20 minutes, do the retinotomy and you can just uh, suck the blood because total is still But that, that in those situations, you are planning for the draining. But majority of cases, if it is arcade to arcade hematoma, four, four to six days diameter roughly, you don't need to uh, drain the blood. And if the height of the... Uh, Submacular hemorrhage is just above the phobia. Even in those situations, the blood will shift go down. 
and I will ask the patient to uh, remain in the propped up position, propped up position for 12 hours, then followed by prone position to shift the residual submacular blood in the periphery. So if the macular part is cleared, getting cleared, the vision will automatically improve. And remaining part of uh, some retinal hemorrhage that may remain in the inferior part, that will hardly affect the vision. I do surgery on if the blood is only above uh, 1,000 micron at the fovea in a PCV case yes. uh, or in a macro aneurysm case. I don't do it if it is less than 1,000 micron at the fovea. So that is my cutoff point. And Dr. LG and I had a discussion on this, and this he directed me also. So can we move on to the next presentation? Yeah, I think we should move on to the next presentation because we are running out of time. Next presentation is by Shubhendu. Can you stop sharing? Yes, sir. Next presentation by Dr. Anand Rajendran about surgical tips and macular TRD. Anand? Yeah. Can you see my uh, slide now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, I'd like to thank the Jaipur Ophthalmic Society, uh, Vishal, Dr. Vendra, Dr. Akesh Mahami. He has been a wonderful experience so far. And so uh, when we talk about TRDs, uh, there's always this debate about unimanual versus bimanual. Personally, I think there's actually no no debate there. I mean, you have to customize it. You have to be you have to be uh, skilled with both approaches and hybridize it. So uh, I like to get when the view is clear, a good preoperative OCT. And that helps in your decision. And when you see a taut hyaloid and thick membranes with focal tractions, like you see on the left here, or with detachment or with uh, skysis, then given the fact that we have such good uh, cutters, especially the bevel cutter from Alcon, and port optimization, you can go a long distance with just unimanual uh, vitrectomy, and you can actually uh, use these planes of attack. On the other hand, if you have a broad attachment, tabletop TRDs, like these, then you know you have to favor bimanual vitrectomy fairly early on, and these would be the planes that I would attack. Now, recently I've been using multicolor imaging a lot more to look at uh, these TRDs. Uh, the fibrous hyaloid shows up in green. You can actually make out the avascular versus the vascularized components, and you can see those hyaloidal openings, which are very important. It's important to know these planes. And you can take advantage of that. And I usually, you know, in this particular case, I had actually gone like that, avoiding those vascular areas. And you can see it's far better than the fundus picture that you see on the right of the MCI. And you can see post to check me a fairly good result. And you can ima even image this through the oil, the multicolor imaging. So coming on to unimanual surgery. So again, there's this debate about should we do inside out or outside in. Again, you should be able to customize your surgical technique to the case in front of you. And uh, for example, I more often than not use inside out simply because the central retina is thicker and very often you have the mid peripheral vitreous well attached to the mid peripheral retina. And in this case, you see uh, that there is a central short hyaloid with the subhyaloid space available. I do a can opener kind of uh, uh, opening of that hyaloid and then in that central rent proceed radially or centrifugally identifying the pain of separation, slightly tug on that, not too hard, and undercut. It's important to have your port facing away from the retina. Another case where one doesn't have one, uh, that uh, advantage of that subhyaloid uh, uh, separation from the macula, so you can choose a weak spot in the taut hyaloid or membrane, create a rent there, again proceed radially using the conformal techniques of uh, membrane peeling that I'll be talking about a little later. Again, undercut it, identify the plane of separation, and that is critical. Now, this is a case where an outside-in approach is useful. Here, you see very clearly that the mid-peripheral vitreous is detached from the mid-peripheral retina, so you can excise that skirt in a latitudinal manner, freeing that central island of taut hyaloid that you see. This has the advantage of avoiding transmission of the central membrane peeling traction forces to the periphery and causing holes, therefore. Uh, so you again identify the pain of uh, uh, separation and go from outside in undercutting that membrane another case which kind of brings it all together the patient had a hemorrhage and then uh, traction under that so i'll just go past that quickly and with the cutter i like to engage the vitreous uh, membranes and what i call tug and tease 
and creating small micro tractions, creating these BR separations as you go along, as you engage that hyaloidal layer. And this patient had some amount of peripapillary traction too. So you can see I'm trimming around the disc in a little while. You have to isolate the traction from the disc and uh, going ahead in that manner and using uh, techniques of conformal and fold back uh, membrane removal. If there are bleeds, you can diathomize or laser. If it's atrophic retina, definitely do avoid diathomizing. A, a gentle laser will do in most cases, more often than not. And another case which, uh, again, there's a very thick, taut central hyoid, there's subretinal hemorrhage there too. Again, it, what this shows is that you don't actually have to remove or un unmask the entire traction. You just have to segment it into islands. And uh, the cutters and nowadays do a great job here. And as you can see, I'm bringing, uh, isolating uh, those segments into different islands. And um, once you segment them, you'll be quite surprised to see how easily you can, given the port optimization, these U cutters actually eliminate those uh, segments. And this was uh, done with the Alcon Ingenuity system. And uh, under air, uh, view becomes clearer, or the BISP hemorrhage goes, and uh, you're able to uh, aspirate the hemorrhages also, and uh, you see it looks fairly flat now. And then you go ahead and do the laser around it in the remaining areas. And so cutting the lamination epidural and membranes, there are two types. The more commoner one, uh, the more difficult one is a conformal cutter delamination where you have rigid ERMs. It's a stiff edge. You need to turn the cutter in your fingers so that the longitudinal axis is aligned to the angle of attack with the desired point of the ERM. The other technique is the foldback cutter delamination where you have these flexible ERMs with a large free edge. And this folds back over itself and the ERM therefore protects the retina. So this kind of demonstrates that uh, the conformal technique where you go kind of parallel to the retina and keep eating it uh, feed the membrane into that uh, port and uh, keep going across like that. And you can take that membrane quite easily. And this is uh, a large free edged membrane, as you can see. And uh, using suction, you fold that back on itself and uh, get, uh, get that membrane off, as you can see. So, uh, just a quick take on a TRD with subhyalo damage. This happens quite often. It's very important to make a rent in that posterior hyoid. First, choose a locus that's free of traction. Drain the subhyalo hemorrhage. Do not go in blind and visualize the vicinity and then, you then proceed. Just a small note there. Coming to bimanual surgery, this is a very vascular uh, uh, membrane. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, it's a very taut hyaluronic ring. The, the membrane is very thick. You need so straight away. You need to know that you need to go with bimanual vitrectomy early on, inside out. The one point I like to stress is that the angle of illumination your assistant needs, if you have a good one, uh, focus that cone of light on the area that you're working on. And the curved scissors is a great boon. The 40 degree curvature of the curved scissors parallels that of the retina gets into these small spaces. You need to make small controlled cuts, not wide, uh, vigorous movements. Uh, this curved scissor is flexible. You can do both segmentation as I'm doing right now, as well as delamination as we'll see in a minute. And uh, uh, because of this fine scissors, yeah, here I'm delaminating it. Just, you just twist it in your arm and you can just do that. And the blades help you to use this also flexibly as a spatula or a uh, blunt dissector as you dissect those uh, uh, membranes. You can see how thick that uh, membrane is. I use the uh, uh, end gripping or the island forceps to grip and evert that membrane. Remember, that right now, the forceps use is not to uh, yank or drag that uh, membrane off. It's only to hold it and evert it so that the scissors can do its job. As you'll see in this very interesting case, with where again, I'm going in with bimanual tracking, there was a severe peripapillary traction, as you'll see, the, uh, uh, Chandler coming in. And uh, the curb scissor help, helps making these small snips. Again, just to stress that the angle of illumination is very important. You have to visualize the exact area that you, you're snipping. And you have to keep that curved scissors facing up and away from the retina and towards the thing. And you have to, when you cut, cut and make a deliberate movement up and away from the retina so that you avoid you know, damaging the retina with your cuts. The bleeds may be passive. Don't get worried about that. And trochlear pressure rise, you can just control that. You see, as long as you see that the bleed is not rapidly increasing, 
uh, you don't have to worry about it. You don't need to go in with the diatomy and do anything there. You can see with that island forceps, I'm, it's a used island forceps that I now prefer to use. And now as I'm grabbing that, you see I'm not exerting a lot of force, but with just that gentle bit, I was surprised to see that stump come out very easily without any vigorous traction on it. And I just went with the flow and then used that forceps to remove the vitreous from the uh, membrane of the retina around. And it just kept going in that direction. And I'm doing that and you see that uh, uh, the entire thing folds, I'm diathomizing the edges so that it curls on itself and separates itself from the retina, detached retina around. And now the cutter, I'm uh, uh, separating the, it entirely and it's now swimming around. It actually looks like a, a, a nucleus fragment. And you're seeing that the entire thing is now detached and I'm just removing the last uh, segments of that and uh, just taking off those last fibrils and it's now going to swim on itself. And then you just keep it and like you would do for a nuclear fragment, just keep it there and the whole thing, it's such a thick fibrous tissue, just gets eaten up right there. You can see it's getting taken right there. So uh, now I like to do island peeling. I feel it should be done when you have residual pucker post membrane peeling. And where I would not do it is if there's severe ischemia or RP degeneration or a trophic macula, you can actually damage it a little more. So you put in the BBG under a bubble of uh, PFCL and then you can evacuate the BBG. And then you see that the ILM actually comes out quite easily, counterintuitively, because uh, the counter traction by the PFCL is, makes the ILM scroll on itself and therefore actually makes it easier to visualize and uh, grab. So you use the pinch and peel technique and uh, you see it's quite easy to uh, do it and comes off fairly easily. So PFCL use, actually I believe it has a negligible role in uh, TRDs because of the risk of you know unnecessarily having subretinal PFCL. Uh, you just need to remove all the traction. Where it's used as, as I'm showing here, island peeling, combined mechanism RDs or if there are breaks, if there is a lot of submacular hemorrhage where you can steamroll out this fluid or the hemorrhage. I occasionally, if there is a lot of blood, I use that to my advantage. If I have to do ILM peeling, I use blood as a stainer. All you need, all BBG does is give you contrast and blood is doing that, then well and good. Might as well go with that. And you can see once you uh, get that stain, it actually uh, helps you a lot. Once you get that, the first peel off is quite easy to complete the uh, uh, ILM peeling. And that's fairly well. So tampon, the question of tampon. And so what everybody should aim is for no breaks or minimal no bleeds. And that TRD is ideally should be left with aerosaline. This is this should be a goal. But in case that you do get you know a couple of breaks or there are minimal bleeds, where you have a fairly flat attached retina, you lasered around those little bleeds, gas can be used. SF6 also is repeat. Silicon oil only there are significant breaks or bleeds. It's a combined mechanism RD as I mentioned. In high risk patient who cannot position prone or is a one-eyed patient, then you might favor a silicon oil. Very important as I'm stressing again, avoid iatrogenic breaks. What, why do these happen? That's because very old, some people believe in you know rapid vigorous PVD induction. They see the thick membrane, they believe they, they need to pull it, yank it out. That, that causes this. Again, exclusive unimanual cutter-based vitrectomy for tabletop TRDs or adherent taut hyaloid membranes to atrophic ischemic retina. When you see that, you know that it's better to go through the biomanual uh, uh, scissor-based approach. Many people have a prejudice against scissors. You know, once they have a great cutter, they think they can use a cutter for everything and complete extension of scissor use. So this, all these things can actually uh, lead to having unnecessary breaks which should be avoided. So basically the cardinal principles, visibility is king. You have to have a good illumination system and a good viewing system. There's no doubt about that. Uh, you have to have primarily one with the given the great cutters that we have. Unimanual, we would go in with, and I would you know, fall back on bimanual immediately if I see those uh, uh, tabletop TRDs, or as I showed up front with the OCT. You need to be skilled with both inside out and outside in approach. You should be able to customize and be flexible in your approach. The great bevel cutters, which are coming in now from Alcon, the 10K, 20K cutters, uh, they, it's a bevel more than the 10K, which I like because it gets you into those small spaces. Please find those VR separation planes. That is the key to TRD surgery. Importantly, try to avoid breaks. Beware of vitreoscisis, which happens in these cases. Uh, it's a good idea and good habit to do repeat transnational uh, uh, stain check. Look for this because uh, uh, residual vitreous can lead to ERMs and can lead to failure in surgery. Membrane peeling, removal, curved scissors are great. As I mentioned, the 40 degree curve helps you get 
do both the segmentation and the delamination. It also parallels the curve of the retina. The techniques of confocal and foldback, uh, as I described, uh, need to be used uh, judiciously. Beta control with IOP rise. Laser is a better option than diathomizing around the uh, area centralis. Triumphs on a plot scan sometimes we left over little bleeders and they you'd be surprised that they actually stop. Preoperative avastin is a great thing and should be done for TRDs with active neovascularization overlying it. And this should be done about three to five days earlier. You can also drop in some avastin. You can give an avastin injection if you find a lot of flat neovascularization after your uh, surgery. Uh, ILM peeling, PFCL, these issues along with tamponade as discussed. So thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Anand, for uh, wonderful uh, concept and videos. But believe me, diabetic vitretomy is one thing where I do not go with a preset mind because uh, all your uh, plans can go haywire. A simple looking job can become time consuming. But uh, wonderful to you know see all your videos. And uh, you see outside in, inside out. So these are all terms which uh, once you are doing surgery, they go for a six because uh, you can't, can't in the, such situations go for a pre-plan. So wherever there is a plane found, wherever there is a weak area, weak adherence, you start dissecting in that area because the aim is to maximize the results with minimal possible complications. Absolutely. Okay. Any comments from others? Vishal? No, sir, I totally agree with him, but I, I just uh, tend, I incline towards the cutter-based approach. So I'm in that group, which believe that cutter can do everything. Yeah. yeah, but do we do the manual? Manual ones. what about by manual? Because there are situations where by manual um, very rarely, sir. Very rarely, but 90% of the surgeries, uh, the cutter alone can suffice for me at least. You see, a yeah. couple of times I have been caught in a situation. Suppose I'm operating left eye and nasal uh, huge fraction, I don't want to leave it, so I have to shift my you know all the uh, infusion cannula to upper nasal quadrant and then shift the microscope, something what I call positional kind of. Uh, do you do such things? Anand, so is that situation. No, yeah. no, ambient extremity is required. Uh, obviously, one would not be doing the vitrectomy with the left hand. I use my left hand for that. Yeah. yeah, so that's what I agree with that. I mean, but uh, given the bevel cutters, as uh, Vishal said, again, most of the time you are able to get away with a lot of unimanual. But in certain situations, you know, especially when you have. Very stiff retinas. Sometimes some you give a erastin patient comes instead of three to five days, you eat the underlying retinas atrophic. You want to avoid those breaks. Sometimes you also want to avoid, you want to shorten your surgery. So uh, I think uh, it's important to have these scissors also in your armamentarium as a backup. Yeah. Ajay, 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 in a tabletop RD, my threshold for conversion to bimanual is if I feel that if the price is a break, I would rather change to you know, ma buy manual and do a Absolutely. you know comfortable search. Ajay, any comments? Ajay, Dr. Ajay Pal, is yours is Ajay. muted, sir. Ajay is muted. Uh, nice presentation, Dr. Anand. Two things I want to ask: Why do you prefer laser in place of diathermy to stop the bleeder? So what I thought was that, you know, diathermy, it can cause uh, sometimes uncontrolled, uh, you know, it can even lead to breaks. I said you can do both, but uh, if there are small pinheads, a small focus yeah. laser will do the job just as well. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah I agree. I agree. As uh, Steve Charles always used to say, never use diathermy. No, I won't say never use it. What I'd say is avoid using it when you suspect a very ischemic, thinned out, atrophic retina. Yeah. Totally agree with you, sir. Suddenly break off. Okay, any words of wisdom from Dr. Hassan Mutada or we move on to the next? Uh, excellent presentation, Anand. Uh, but I, I think um, in, uh, as Vishal said, in 90% you can do the surgery with the probe. Um, but uh, sometimes the, um, the EP centers are too close to each other that you cannot uh, introduce or insinuate the probe uh, to cut between the EP centers and in this case you have to go with the uh, bimanual. Also if the underlying retina is ischemic, atrophic, uh, then I think the bimanual also decreases the instance of uh, right. iatrogenic retinal breaks. 
Um, so I think uh, whether to, uh, to, 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 do, to do bimanual or unimanual depends on how the epicenter are close to each other. And um, so sometimes in um, broad sheets, the epicenters are distant from each other and you can do the job with the, the probe. And um, sure. there is no need for bimanual. Absolutely. You see, there are situations, uh, bimanual meaning there is not dead. You see, you have to have recourse for bimanual. There, uh, you know, it is very, very adherent and it's very difficult to find a plane. So maybe in 5-10%, but definitely yes. So that would also be around there. Yeah. So we cannot say that um, uh, there is no place for the bimanual. No, there, yeah. there is a place for the bimanual. No, Vishal is a very daring and great surgeon. He's a very great surgeon. He, I think, manages uh, Subrendu, Boral, and all these people are young, great people doing very well with the uh, unimanual only. We are old people. We somehow have low threshold for conversion to bimanual uh, in some situations. Okay, I think uh, we'll move on. We'll move on to uh, uh, Dr. Shobit uh, about his talk on uh, foveal schesis. I think uh, uh, Dr. Hussain has already covered. Let's see what Shobit has to add to this. My presentation is necessarily an ode to what I've learned from Professor Mortada. And uh, first, I would like to profusely thank him for removing the myth and saving me from learning the art of matter buckling. Uh, and realizing that this surgery can be done effectively without knowing the nuances of that. So I would like to present a couple of cases and because he has already covered the topic beautifully. So this is a 38 year old female patient with this decrease of vision in the left eye. And I saw her in uh, this was in 12th March, 1919, and this was the picture. I advised her <clears throat> surgery. I, in fact, advised her to come back to me after two months so that I could document progression and advise surgery. She decided to wait a year, no harm. She came back with 636 vision after a year. And the schesis had progressed with a, almost a whole forming and a large detachment across the fovea. So I like to combine most of my these cases with phaco emulsification because that takes care of the myopia from the point of view of the refractive component. Eye limb peeling, I used, because the eye was large, I used C3F8, I use only 10% or I use SF6, 10% or I use just tear. And this is the procedure which I did. And what I want to highlight in this case is the traction which existed temporal to the fovea where the initial schesis had started with the hyaloid ILM complex causing that. So I use uh, Professor Mortada's multiple layer, which he calls as the envelope technique, along with a much wider peel. So I fortify the already thinned out foveal area, do a wide peel. Here I first did the nasal, but the main point of traction was on the temporal side, which was even identifiable clinically. So we did a nice temporal peel and put all the four flaps on the macula and I widened the temporal peel even more. So this is still with the air gas mixture in and post of one week she showed excellent resolution already. You can see the island flaps in future follow-up, 618 unaided vision because we had to combine it with a phaco emulsification. 
So I will straight. So what is the essential difference when we compare a myopic foveoschisis to a X-linked juvenile foveoschisis? This is a comparison I like to use. You see the, here the ILM is not under traction, while here the ILM complex because obviously of the growth of the eyeball is under traction along with the posterior hyaloid and the skytic vitreous. So I like to group these patients into a simple or a compound where it extends through multiple layers, which I feel is one of the simplest combinations. Previously, uh, in my earlier cases, I used to do a, before I came in contact with Professor Motrada, I used to do a white peel and uh, just an ILM peel, but now I do a foveal sparing peel. This is a patient with the white peel. I just wanted to show the difference. Pre-op vision 2120. Uh, sorry, it was counting finger and post-op 20, uh, 2040. Sorry for sorry for this wrong uh, that thing. Because we had again combined it with phaco emulsification. So what is my take on this surgery? There is a variability of response to surgery. Combined surgery works better in my hands. I don't do a indentation base excision, but I do a wide vitrectomy because I've already removed the lens. History of recent progressive decrease in vision is a good prognostic marker for me in these cases. Peripheral retina checkup is very important at conclusion. In absence of macular hole, ILM peel can give results. And even in macular hole, it gives excellent results. And even if you have a myopic macular hole with detachment, the flap te technique works good. For anterior segment surgeons, important to rule out MMT before taking up patients of disproportionate visual loss for cataract surgery in myopic eyes. So these are some other cases, pre-op and post-op, done all by the flap technique. You see, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Dr. Ajay, do you want to make a comment? Because uh, you were uh, uh, trying to say something, your mic got muted. Yes, Ajay. Can't hear. Yeah. Vishal, can you hear? No, sir. Uh, you can carry on. Ajay, Ajay is here. Ajay sir, your mic is muted. Yeah. Ajay, mic is muted. Mic yeah. is okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And now it's on. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Hassan and uh, even Dr. Shobi's opinion on it. Like, uh, if we uh, make two large uh, flaps, ILM flaps. As Dr. Hassan showed in his first case, so sometimes it gets collected on the pre-foveal area, center of the fovea, especially if we have used PHCL uh, during making the flaps. It has happened to me too. Uh, since then, I remove the PHCL and trim it a little bit. Don't keep it that large. And uh, in both my patients, the visual acuity was little limited than compared to other patients. So what's the observation of others? Especially, I want to ask this question to Dr. Hassan and uh, Dr. Sophie. See, the peel is never done under PFCL unless the retina is detached. Uh, if we have a detachment along with the myopic macular hole, that's where we use PFCL during the peel. The yeah. peel is done without the PFCL in place. And uh, because I'm not doing a very aggressive base excision and I'm combining with the FACO, yeah. so I'm going to do quite a lot of peripheral vitrectomy without that thing, but yes, if I was doing, uh, when I'm doing a macular case with a detachment, I like to keep the PFC. Professor Mokada, over to you. Yes, um, in myopic foveous cases, as you know, there is no detachment, but uh, the retina may be, uh, may be elevated, and there is no need to use PFCL during uh, the ILM peeling or making the flaps. Uh, but uh, as uh, Shabit said, um, if the retina is detached, you may do it with or without PFCL. If it is safer to do it with PFCL, then go ahead and do it. Um, but um, in my the, the the drawback 
with the PFC allele that once the retina is attached in these highly myopic eyes, the contrast is less than because the underlying retina, uh, the underlying choroid and RPE are atrophic, degenerated. So the, the, uh, the contrast is less. Sometimes you need to augment the staining, as we said, but you can do this by injecting the dye under the PFCL. So you go with it, but it is, more, it is easier to do it in the absence of PFCL. So I may start doing uh, with a detached retina, uh, uh, doing the eye lamp peeling without PFCL. Um, if it is difficult and the risk of tearing the retina is there, then I first I restain and then I inject PFCL. In order Always. to have uh, my question, my question was, uh, sir, I think uh, Dr. Ajay is trying to say that if, because of sometimes overstuffing or large flaps, there is a hump in the center. Like in your first case, I saw because I usually trim that. Uh, I had also had a bad experience, like the patient had a little poorer vision gain, possibly because of that uh, material in front of foveola. So it is not good to trim it if it's. Uh, the flaps are too large. Yes, you can uh, in, in an eye in a foveal schism, you can trim it, and also in myopic macular hole, you can trim it. Um, um, and uh, the OCT picture will be much nicer with no um, this uh, no hum -hum. elevated yeah. hub. Yeah, exactly. But um, believe me, it has nothing to do with the visual acuity, acuity. and it never induces. Okay pre-retinal fibrosis or pre-retinal membranes or epiretinal membranes. So uh, maybe the, uh, the, 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 the OCT does not look nice, but uh, you can avoid this by trimming the, the flaps. And uh, then you can create the flap uh, over the hole or you leave it without um, creating flaps over the foveous cases. In foveous cases, the aim is not to peel over the phobia. That, that, that is, this is the the, the, the target. So I'm not so I'm not to create a macular hole. But with in the present in the in the presence of macular hole, you need the flaps to to put them over the macular hole, not to close the hole, but to assist in closure of the hole. It, and the flaps are not inside the hole; they are over the hole. It is not. Um, uh, inside the hole, it is just put over the hole. So it is not stuffed. So it is not a mechanical. It is not a mechanical. It is not stuffed. No, it is not stuffed. Yeah. Never. Professor Martara, I would like to have your opinion. Most of my cases, patients demand a FACO along with this macular surgery uh, with uh, even myopic eyes, even if they are a little young. And they then demand a surgery for the other eye, for the cat, for the clear lens. Uh, I, which, you know, because of the disparity, I don't want to make them myopic in this eye. So I like to aim towards a myopia of about minus 1.5, which I keep them. So what is your opinion whether we should be combining a phaco emulsification despite clear view in this eye or not? Because many times I refuse them. Because I tell them that I'll have to unnecessarily do the other eye. I would like to, your opinion, yes. If the patient is elderly, I go in for both. If the patient is young and has a, a myopic macular hole uh, with, with or without detachment, I try hard to preserve, to preserve the lens so as not to do FACO. But um, if yeah. there is cataract or... Um, so uh, uh, you are obliged to do, or you are forced to do uh, combined fake of um, Post-operatively, you can correct the other eye with um, contact lens or something like that. Um, yeah, that's the first uh, option but, to get. But, but yes, but I'm, I'm not with doing clear lens extraction on the, on the other eye. Um, you see, because I'm also not in favor, that's why I avoid it. Young patients, but uh, the
There have been instances when they have demanded it because they want to get rid of the refractive issue also. I know, but I'm just, that's why I put up this point. It's a practical issue. Yeah. Young yeah, patients, yeah. because yeah. many yeah. of them have not come to you for the macular pathology. They have come to the hospital for a refractive procedure. And the macular pathology is discovered during their work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you are right. Both, but both. Um, we start with the contact lens, and if the patient um, is motivated uh, to have surgery on the other eye, um, I don't like to put fake kick eye oil. I don't like these lenses. No. Um, I, uh, if the patient can wear a contact lens, and uh, some of them can wear a contact lens. Uh, yes. Uh, but if there is a contraindication or the, the cornea become irritated, um, or uh, vascularized, uh, so you have to do uh, clear lens extraction, put an eye well. May I ask a question? Yes, yeah. yes. yes. Sir, your first case, your first case was having a vision difference of one eye six nine, other eye six twelve. So, do you keep any vision difference of a particular uh, level? For Covish ICS or uh, the retinal surgery for myopic macular hole kind of thing, because only one line difference was there. Though it has no, no, that time. was in the initial second second visit was six thirty. So, yeah. so I corrected her, and now now she's after my life for the surgery in the six <laughs> nine. So she's I demanding it. I trying to tell ah, her to use ICL the lens, but she has already taken a date from the. He's even got her COVID test done. Sir, any audience I questions are there? I think is right yeah. for a refractive surgery, ICL or something can Dr. be done. Yeah. Yeah. I have advised her yeah. ICL, yeah. but she says I don't yeah. want to go undergo two procedures in the lift. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Arkisharma? I her ICL yes, only yes. For with my uh, cornea colleague. Yes, I have a few questions. Yes, sir. If time permits and if you permit, yeah, I yeah, can go. I have a quick questions from the audience also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there is one question from Dr. Pawan Puneet Malhotra from Chandigarh. He says he wants to know what is the meaning of choroidal graft alignment. Dr. Subindu. Yes. What is the meaning of choroidal graft alignment? Graft alignment, that means it should be centrally placed in the macular area. No, I think he means whether it's upside down or, you know, the other way around. On the reverse. On the reverse. You should always respect the upside down manner of the collateral graft. And it should be aligned in such a way so that it can it can attain it can attain its position in the future phobia. Okay. Okay. And uh, another back. question. Another question from Dr. Anand Pangargar from Maharashtra. He wants to know from Dr. Hassan Murtada that what is what happens to the central ILM left in place? In doing foveal sparing ILM peel. So, what are the sequelae and what are the complications or side effects, whatever? Dr. Hassan, um, please. Yeah, there is no complication from leaving uh, these uh, small flaps around the, the fovea. And um, after some time, you cannot detect them clinically. And um, you, you, uh, usually, I do not do OCT as long as the patient is not complaining and as long as the retina is stable. But clinically, you cannot detect them anymore. Maybe after a few months, you cannot see them on by microscopy. So I, 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 don't, I don't see any harm of um, leaving these ILM flaps around the fovea. And usually but on, they this. But on OCT, they will be visible forever. Yes, yes. Okay. but. Uh, the, uh, uh, this doesn't mean they are doing any harm to the uh, to the fovea. Okay. Um, on the contrary, you are protecting the the fovea from the development of a macular hole. If you peel the ILM across the fovea. And second question to you, Dr. Hassan, is that uh, how how to manage cases with post-op graft shrinkage. And are there any chances of traumatic CNVM while maneuvering the graft? Uh, how can you manage? Uh, can you say the, the question again? How to manage cases with post-op graft shrinkage 
the shrinkage of the graft in the post op period and are there any chances of traumatic uh, cnvm or the choroidal neovascular membrane developing uh, with the manipulation um, uh, i i haven't seen you, you mean retinal graft yeah. retinal graft yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i haven't seen um, uh, retinal graft shrinking <coughs> the aim is to close the macular hole so and so, uh, also after some time you cannot detect clinically the graft but the hole is closed and this is the target so right. um, um, and the incidence of uh, iatrogenic cnvm no 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 okay. Uh, 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 unless, unless you in, you iatrogenically injured the uh, the RPE and the underlying choroid, but if the operation went uneventfully, then there is no uh, iatrogenic CMV. Okay. Another question from Dr. Sonal Kalia to you is: If myopic <laughs> previous cases cases, they have coexisting immature cataract. Will you do a FACO along with the retinal surgery or you do it before going ahead? No, with the I, do it, I do it simultaneously at the same time. Combine yes. FACO vitrectomy. As Dr. Shobit does. Shobit yes. Also. We are also doing almost all our surgeries combined nowadays. Uh, combined at least macular surgeries. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Even, di uh, Vishal, even diabetic vitrectomies. Even diabetic vitrectomies. Absolutely. There's no need yes. to uh, cash in those. Yes. Cataract. Yes, in diabetic vitrectomy, and because during surgery, if you um, left the lens in place, the back surface of the lens after some times becomes opacified with feathery opacification, and the visibility is hindered, and you cannot uh, continue the surgery uh, under good visualization, and um, you cannot remove the eye internal limiting membrane, so. And you cannot remove the vitreous base properly. So all these problems can be solved by combining vitrectomy with uh, FACO and, uh, um, uh, and PCIOL. Um, the problem of posterior sanicia, lens deposits on the lens, um, the, I'm aware of all these complications. But if you weigh which is better, Finally, uh, you came to the conclusion that removing the lens at the time of surgery um, offers much, much better uh, advantages or more advantages. I agree, I agree with you. And Professor uh, Mokrada, moreover, as compared to the time when in the early 90s when we were doing ECC IOL combined with vitrectomy with these eyes and not using any anti-VGFs and our laser pros were also not, not that good that they could reach the extreme periphery. There was more incidence of post-operative rubiosis. Uh, nowadays, we hardly see it because we are yes. lasering right with the curved probes up till the aura, aura. the shot of the aura and we are giving pre-op anti-VGF and even giving post-operative if needed. True, true. Uh, may I add something regarding the rubiosis? So uh, I think um, why we are not seeing uh, more rubiosis, or we are seeing less rubiosis than in the past, yeah. because we are applying laser up to the aura. Exactly. In the past, because um, we were preserving the lens, uh, laser was only applied to the equator exactly. or just to the pre-equatorial. But nowadays, we do indentation. We apply laser to the retina, over the aura. And um, if we review the old literature, the, the, the post-operative hemorrhage that, were, uh, that was occurring at that time was due to new vessels developing from the peripheral retina, the peripheral ischemic retina. Nowadays, we do not see abuses, and we rarely see post-operative hemorrhage or late post-operative hemorrhage because the periphery the, the ischemic peripheral retina is already ablated and lasered. So these complications are now very, very rarely seen. And uh, basically the port, 20 gauge port, and the portion between the aura and 20 gauge port was also prone to port 
pressurization as compared to these smaller gauge uh, ports. Uh, what is your view on? I, I think I think uh, with a small gauge vitrectomy system, um, also the instance of vascularization, the inner vascularization or the vascularization of the sclerotomy from inside is much less than much. with the 20. And yeah. um, also with the use of the troker system, because with the 20, by the end of the operation, um, the, you find your sclerotomy is not 20 gauge. It is larger than yeah. 20 gauge. Yeah. Uh, but now we are using uh, trokers that, uh, and also the, um, the, um, the slanting or the, uh, the direction of the wound is not perpendicular, it is uh, beveled. And also this um, induce, induces self-closure uh, of, the, um, of the sclerotomy. We do not use sutures uh, anymore in most of the cases. And uh, so the development in the wound, wound, wound um, uh, uh, construction, wound closure, um, laser to the periphery of the retina, base uh, vitrectomy, uh, proper base vitrectomy, all these contributed to less instance of um, hemorrhage and rubuses and uh, what was described as retro lentil uh, fibrovascular proliferation. Dr. Lalit, any finishing remarks, sir? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, we had had a wonderful uh, uh, webinar, wonderful educational uh, exercise thanks to wonderful videos by everybody in fact uh, although hassan motada's uh, videos were very good but i think uh, subhendra vishal sangeet and uh, anand the uh, shobhit everybody sangeet but very nice videos i must uh, you know compliment all the speakers and must uh, you know uh, appreciate uh, the efforts of uh, dr virinder agarwal rk and and uh, uh, all the members of JOS, specifically Vishal, for uh, bringing in uh, our guest speaker, Hassan Motada, for this thank lovely you. evening. And Sir, all thank of you, all the delegates and uh, the stellar faculty and all the panelists for contributing. And also, thank you, Elergan, for providing the logistics for today's webinar. And a special gratitude to our international overseas guest, Professor Motada, for delivering the keynote. And I hope you stay safe and hope to see all of you in all your glory, physical glory, very soon. Yeah. And also, <laughs> thank, also thank you to <laughs> Neuro Technologies for flawless. Yeah, and Sai for the logics. Yeah. Yeah. Happy thank Independence Day to all of you. Jai Hind. Yeah. And a happy Independence Day to everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Very, very good videos for me, who is not a retina person, but I enjoyed very good videos. Thank you. Thank you, Virinda. Thank you, Virinda. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Viru. Thank you, Dr. Motorada. Take care and stay safe. Thank you. Good night, sir. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye, everyone.